of a new age consulting firm called Consolidon. Uh, new age in the sense that we didn't grow like a tra traditional consulting firm. What we did instead was we partnered with uh, a lot of boutique consulting firms. So we've partnered with more than uh, 300 boutique consulting firms from all over the globe. Uh, this strategy helped us scale very quickly. Uh, so we set up in 2017 and by 2019, the end of year 2019, we were already 500 consultants. Uh, of course, not full time. All of them were working for boutique consulting. Most of them were working for boutique consulting firms. We delivered about 200 consulting projects till the end of 2019. Um, 2020 was supposed to be a great year. It, uh, you know, it was. Uh, it would have been the year that we would have scaled up. Unfortunately, like many other organizations, uh, we felt the initial shock of uh, COVID-19 as well in March and April. Um, we decided in April that we'd spend at least, uh, you know, all our excess capacity, and we did have a lot of excess cap capacity by then. We decided that we're going to spend this excess capacity on interesting projects, which will uh, help organizations get back on track. Uh, for example, we set up uh, the Superheroes project last year, which was uh, nothing to do with gamification, but the Superheroes project was, um, uh, we got about 700 business leaders across the GCC region, uh, the Gulf region, to uh, help micro businesses and small businesses get back on track. This year, what we decided to do was set up something called Connected Insights. Connected Ins Insights is a seven day web summit where we're doing workshops like this. We're doing six workshops like this every, every day from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Dubai time. Uh, we're doing uh, about 50 panel discussions and webinars. So this is day five. Uh, so it's been a very heavy week for us. Uh, and it's the end of a week of about, I think, close to 30 webinars and panel discussions. Um, it's our way, again, of using some of our excess capacity to, uh, to give back, this time to also larger organizations, not just small businesses. Um, I met uh, Javier uh, very early on in setting up uh, setting up Consolidon uh, through another friend in, in Colombia. Uh, I was extremely, extremely uh, impressed uh, by, by the knowledge that he brought to gamification. I had an idea in gamification back then, Javier, if you remember in 2018 perhaps, which I shared with him and I want to bring to reality, maybe not this year, maybe that's our interesting project for 2022. But I thought when we were doing this summit, it would have been incomplete without a workshop from Javier. So that's just a quick background. Uh, Javier, I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, really looking forward to this workshop. I should say one, one more thing quickly, Javier. Um, we'd like for everyone, if you're okay with it, to, um, you know, to participate, interact, uh, share your videos if you're okay with that, uh, work with us on this, uh, on this, uh, on this, uh, in this workshop. So, uh, that's a quick thing I'd like to say, Javier, sorry, over to you. Okay, perfect. So first of all, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, time and attention are the most precious resources we have right now and you're giving me both of them. So I hope I can make it worth it, worth it right? So um, for this workshop, I will call, call it more a play shop than a workshop in the sense that I want I want you to be in, uh, interacting with the with the whole presentation and the, with the whole uh, knowledge I will try to transmit uh, to you. Uh, so um, be ready because it will be interactive in in some ways, uh, right? So I I tend to do something and it is maybe a game designer bias, and it is that as game designers we usually tend to design more content that than our players will actually use. So I created a long presentation. I'm not sure I will be able to go over all the presentation. Uh, I don't, I, I, that's not the point of it. I created a lot of things just to be able to, to depending on how we are doing, see if I can uh, delve deeper into some topics or others. So I can choose a little bit if I, I feel maybe uh, we should focus more on some stuff or another. Uh, so don't, don't, don't feel bad if I just skip some slides that can, that can happen. Um, but I hope that the things I will tell you in these uh, three hours will, will help you understand what are the basics 
of gamification, of meaningful gamification, of understanding how gamification can actually change behaviors, change mm -hmm. people, change organizations, right? So I, I want you to understand that this is a process that if you don't play games, it doesn't matter. Because we're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about creating games per se, right? So there's game-based learning, right? Of course, there is game-based learning and there are serious games. I'm not going to talk about serious games or game-based learning right now. Of course, that's something I, I actually do uh, as well. Many people are asking me to just design games for them. But gamification is about understanding uh, how to apply all these game design concepts in real world scenarios. So it's more of a design process built for real world activities and not just these simulations that you can create through uh, game based learning, right? So, uh, of course, uh, I love games in all of its forms. So everything works for me. I, I am a big board gamer, for example, uh, more than a video gamer. I was a big video gamer before. Now I, I like to play more board games. Uh, I used to play role-playing games. I have played escape rooms, alternate reality games, everything that comes into my lap. I just played and studied it. I like to study games. And from this, uh, this analytical approach to game design, when I found gamification, I started working on my own framework, which is called BEM. This is mm. a framework that I've created uh, like five years ago. I started working on the framework. I have been working on it since. Uh, I, I'm still growing the ideas behind the framework. I am still analyzing new things to incorporate into the, into the framework. So it's not a finished or closed framework, but that it has actually allowed me to create great gamification projects with real impact in the world. Before that, I, I, have, I have been working with gamification for eight years. And the first four years, uh, I had a lot of missed opportunities uh, to a lot of failures in the sense that uh, the basic gamification schemes would work in a really short term, but will would fail in a longer term. Uh, so I started working uh, from another point of view around how to create meaningful gamification. And this is what I'm going to show you. So uh, to start, so First, again, welcome to the play shop, right? So a play shop is, as I told you, a play shop will be something where you will be interacting with me. Uh, interaction is a tricky concept because uh, in these virtual environments, uh, of course, you, you wish to be able to see your audience. You wish to be able to see your audience react, right? But I will not ask you necessarily to put your camera on. That's, that, that's voluntary, of mm. course. Uh, but I want to be able to interact with you to see what happens. And I will do it by using the chat in Zoom, right? So uh, have your chat ready because we will be using the chat for a lot of things. And of course, if you want to raise your hand, you want to ask questions, I don't mind going out of topic. I don't mind uh, exploring things that you think are really interesting to, uh, to go deeper into. So uh, just raise the hand in Zoom and just ask the question or leave it on the chat. It's, it's, it's good as well. And I will be answering on the go, right? So I won't have Q and A uh, segments in the workshop. Maybe sometimes I will ask you if you have any questions, but uh, it's, I, I want it to be as, as dynamic as it can be. So let's begin. Okay, so loading. Let's start loading this presentation. So you will see this screen appear from time to time with a little bit of tips, a little bit of snippets of information you can take away and uh, using to build a model in your mind about around what's gamification. That's what loading the screens are used for in uh, video games right now. You have a loading screen, you give a tip to the player. So that's what I'm doing here. So uh, the first tip I want you to understand that meaningful change is not a behavioral process, it's a cognitive one, okay? So this will be really important for me. I want you to try to understand this idea of what is a behavioral process, what is a cognitive process, and why does change require cognitive change and not just behavioral change, which is something that people strive to do all the time and that gamification has tried to do in the past, right? So I want you to be aware of these concepts uh, along the, the play show. So let's begin. So first, as in any game, we need to have a tutorial mode, a place where you will 
learn the basic concepts. And from those concepts, we will do a small exercise to understand the mechanics that we will be using along all the workshop. Uh, so in this tutorial mode, I want you to know and understand uh, types of change. What are the types of change that we actually, as a human species right now in this 21st century, we're trying to use to actually modify people's behaviors and thoughts, right? So we will try to make a little bit of a, of a quick summary, not an exhaustive summary, but some of the main tendencies of how we try to create change. So the first one is the behavioral approach, right? So the behavioral approach, what do you try to do in a behavioral approach? You want to try to reinforce behaviors, basically through rewards and punishments. This is the classic way of changing behavior. This is the way that parents use with their children. So if you don't do your homework, I will take your PlayStation away. Uh, but if you have good grades, I can take you, mm. um, I don't know, to um, go see the world. Uh, we have this idea that we can create behavior by giving consequences to actions, right? So uh, the thing with beha the behavioral approach is that it creates an external locus of change. This means that you're not changing because you want to change, because you think the activity you're doing is really important. You're just doing the activity because you want to get the reward. And this is really important to understand uh, because that difference between doing things uh, for an intrinsic purpose or an extrinsic one can actually change a lot how change is developed in, uh, in, the, in, in your players, in the people you want to actually improve in something, right? So behavioral approach is uh, used a lot. The first systems of gamification were really based on this behavioral approach, uh, but it has its failures, of course. All of these have different kinds of failures, and we will see a little bit of that in a moment. So secondly, there's the learning approach. The learning approach, these, these, pro these approaches are really classic approaches uh, that are really hardwired into our brains. The learning approach comes from our school systems. Our school system, what, what it tries to do is to create understanding of the processes of thought and the skills I need to create by doing exercises in controlled environments. Basically, a school is a controlled environment where people can try to learn about different stuff without having to actually use the stuff in real life. And we do that a lot. So we actually are here in a play shop where we are doing kind of learning approach. And in learning approaches, the thing with learning approaches is that uh, the metacognition to bring those abilities to the real life is actually not that easy. It's a lot, it's based a lot on understanding mm -hmm. and not a lot on a skill building. And we have been trying to change that in education. So there's there are a lot of education tendencies that try to create learning, a, a, a learning environment that's more applicable to real life, but it's really hard in terms of how how we understand learning. So uh, a person talking to other people in an auditorium, telling them a lot of information and assuming you will be able to just keep all the information in and be able to use that information in a meaningful way. So the learning approach creates change. The schools have created mm -hmm. active change by making people rethink the way they understand the world, but it's not enough, of course. So then comes the motivational approach. The motivational approach, uh, what it tries to do is to create an emotional attachment to change. And that is done by satisfying intrinsic needs. So the user is the one that wants to change, right? So think of social media. Social media is built around core drivers, core human drivers, and uh, drivers that require us to be connected to other people, that we want to have a really quick feedback and really quick interactions. And we want to be able to share what is important to us. And those are intrinsic drives that the system use to change the way you behave and think. So this motivational approach has been really successful in a lot of ways. It also has its 
problems, and I will talk about those problems, you need to be able to really design well a motivational approach to make it work. Uh, but it has worked. You know, it has been really studied, and motivation studies um, the last 60 years have been uh, really extensive in the academia. And we have a lot of information, a lot of information now around how we can motivate people. Then there is the systemic approach. The systemic approach uh, is about changing the system so the users will have to adapt to the new system and think about new strategies and new ways of thinking. Here I placed a board game that's actually called Pandemic. And I used this board game as an example precisely because we have lived through a systemic approach very recently with the pandemic. And it's the idea that if the rules of our society have to change really quickly. We have to understand how to adapt to those new rules. And from that adaptation, many things can actually change over time and create long lasting changes. For example, a lot of companies are finding out that having offices with a lot of people is not, it's not something that they really need, that uh, doing home office is actually a possibility, something that they didn't talk about before. And it's because the system changed in a way that it, it forced the, the, the human beings to adopt a new strategy and then evaluate that new strategy. So the systemic approach is about changing the rules of the game. And this is something that happens every time you play a board game. Every board game has a different systemic approach, has a different rule set, and you have to adapt your behaviors to that particular rule set. So this is really important in terms of understanding gamification in a sense. So let's continue. And now we have the bias approach. The bias approach or the behavioral economics approach, I didn't call it like that because well, it's really long and we have already a behavioral approach. I call it the bias approach, uh, is the idea that we uh, now understand, we have like 30 years of understanding on how our brain reacts to information and that how that affects our decision-making process. And what we have found is that our brains are really biased. It ha they have a lot of biases based on some in really key heuristics in our brains that help us uh, make quick decisions. So what they have found, and this is what behavioral economists do, right, is they try to find how to change the way people make decisions by nudging them, changing the environment, the informational environment around them. So the, here is an example of, an, of a behavioral approach, an economic behavioral approach that many people quote in gamification as if it was gamification. It actually isn't, but it has this idea uh, around playfulness where um, the designers wanted people to avoid taking the staircase, the, the electric staircase, and they created a piano staircase so people would be driven to choose the more healthy way of going up and down the stairs, right? So I didn't create any coercion. It's not punishment or rewards per se as in the first approach. It's just changing the, the information environment so people will judge information differently and make different choices. It has a lot of limitations. Uh, behavioral economists, economists will not tell you this, but actually using nudges tend to backfire a lot in real life because uh, behavioral economists uh, tend to study all of this in, in closed environments in laboratories where they take all the variables out to see how people react to certain information. And when you place all the variables again in the real world, people are nudged by a, by a, by a lot of things. And mot the motivational approach uh, sometimes help you explain why many people don't go for the nudges as we would think they would. So, uh, but the bias approach is a really probabilistic approach. It's, it works with a lot of people, but it will never, and none of these approaches will never work with all the people. It's impossible. We will see why, but uh, it, it tends to backfire sometimes. So it's, it's, it's really hard to pull off. It's not as easy as when you read the behavioral economic books where you say, okay, this is easy to do. It's, it's, harder, than, it's harder than you think. And finally, we have the persuasive approach. The persuasive, persuasive approach is about uh, understanding that I can, without changing the system, we can try to change the way people feel about stuff, right? So we can create desire through emotional arguments. 
and and most of them are, are emotional arguments. This is what salespeople do and what social hacking does. It's about understanding that if someone refers to me some kind of information, I will be more, uh, I will have a more, uh, uh, a bigger tendency to react on that information than, in, than if I check it on uh, an advertisement uh, on an online platform, for example, right? So the persuasive approach requires human interaction and it requires this emotional approach to the things that I want people to change about. The persuasive approach actually works really well when you fall in love, because when you fall in love with someone, you become open-minded to their ideas. And everything they say, it's more persuasive than everything that other people tend to say. So people that fell in love, especially when they're in, teen in, in their teenage years, they tend to change a lot depending on what other people tell them. Their close, their close friends or their significant other in that moment will change a lot of your behaviors, more than your parents will do with the behavioral approach or the learning approach. So this is really important as well. So as you can see, change can have a lot of techniques, right? So I haven't mentioned a lot of gamification here right now, mm -hmm. not still, but I want you to have the whole idea of how I can create change because all these ideas have been approached by consultants, by people that have specialized in them. And uh, a lot of great things have been going on. Also a lot of awful things because these approaches can actually make you do things that you want, you don't want to do, right? So the ethics behind all these things around change are actually one of, of the main things that have been discussed. So if you're watching Netflix, The Social Dilemma, you will see a lot of uh, things that will make you uncomfortable. So uh, this is the, the, the main idea. Change can be done in several ways. So how can we try to understand these approaches? These approaches can have two axes. Some are more human oriented and some are more system oriented, right? One, some of these approaches want to change the system. Some of these approaches want to change the human beings. And when you're changing the human beings, there are also two uh, ways of thinking around how to change a human being. You can have an extrinsic approach where you change it by changing its environment and its information status or a, a more intrinsic approach where you try to change the way they think. Those are the two main ways of trying to create change. The easiest one tends to be more extrinsic, but it's not as lasting. I will talk about that in a, way, in a little. And so here's when we will start our play show, really. So now it's the tutorial begins. So what you see here, we are in the first round of our play show. And uh, we, the first round is about the behavioral approach, the rewards and punishment approach. And I want you to think in one, in one of these slots, the one, two, three, or four, um, the it would be mapped, the behavioral approach would be mapped to one of those spots. So what I want you to do is go to the chat and think about where should I place the behavioral approach. So you just have to place one and enter, two and enter, but we will do it in a way that let's, let, let's do it all together. So press the, the number in the keypad, but don't press enter until I say so. That Those are the rules of the game. I want you to play, place the number and when I count to three, you will all place enter and we will see the results for the round one to see how you think around these concepts. This is called metacognition. I want you to know how you think and how you approach these concepts, okay? So press a number in the chat, okay? And I will count to three and just give me an enter, okay? So one, two, three, go. Amazing people. Okay, nice. So we have two, two, three, one, three, one, one, three, one, right? So there's a lot of diversity of thought here. Okay. So this is one of the main things that we have to understand around gamification. New concepts, when we deal with new concepts where there is a lot of uncertainty, we tend to speculate a lot around those, those concepts. And we have a big margin of error. This is normal, right? So let me. Uh, let, let's try to check your guess against uh, the way I map the behavioral approach. So if you see the behavioral approach, 
I put it round around here. This would be the number one. So those that place number one, give, your, give yourselves a point here. So uh, it's the number one. In what sense? The behavioral approach tends to change a little bit the system because I need to create new rules. So it does have some system oriented design, but it changes it just as needed to create the incentives. I just need to create some additional rules to understand if something happens, I will punish you or I will reward you. But that's all the systemic change I really need to do, right? But when I try to incorporate these kind of behavioral approaches, it's really extrinsic because what I'm trying to do is create that if then condition where the if is the activity or the goal I want you to make and the then is the thing that I'm negotiating with you that I want you to have but that the thing that you desire so I will give you what you desire if you give me what I want so our brains one of the things that our brain does is when I have this kind of behavioral approaches my brain will start understanding that the value of the activity is related to the value of the reward. And our brain will start to hardwire that process. So for example, if a musician loves to play music, right? And it, he loves the piano and he composes piano songs and he's really happy with that. And he starts entering contests on, uh, that he starts winning contests around his piano skills. And these contests start giving him money and recognition and all of these extrinsic things. What will happen over time is that this pianist will start thinking that it is uh, playing the piano is rewarding because he is winning money, he's winning recognition because he's getting all of this other stuff. And what will happen is if that, uh, if that person cannot play in contests anymore, if he, he's unable to keep uh, winning in those contests, he will stop playing the piano. And this has been seen in a lot of places. People that work a lot, in, they start working on a hobby and they love that hobby. And they start working on that hobby and they start winning, earning money for working on that hobby. If the money stops, these people tend to start searching for other hobbies. They, they, they don't roll back to liking the hobby because I like it, right? So. And this is really problematic. I, I design games for a living, and I understand the problems that could come from these kind of approaches. If, if, my, if my company st uh, started failing, I might stop designing games uh, as I did before. I did it before because I liked it. Now it's kind of a mixed behavior for me because I know a lot of this stuff and I, I have some barriers, so this won't happen to me, but it's really hard. Actually, it's really hard. So the behavioral approach will take the value out of the activity that we want to incorporate and will give it to the reward. And this is really problematic. You take the reward away, the behavior will cease. That's called extinction of reward and it's really problematic. I actually got engaged in a discussion in LinkedIn where someone uh, was showing that they were giving uh, like $1 for each book his son finished reading. And it was a big discussion because there was a lot of people saying this will kickstart his need to read and he will start reading and he will become a great reader. And the science says otherwise. The science says this person, when they take the, the money away, they will stop reading. They will, they, they will lose that love for reading. And this can be compensated. And it's not an always rule, but it happens a lot. So for this second, uh, the second round, we have the learning approach. So again, we, you know the mechanics. I will explain them again through press the button, the one, two, three, or four button in your keypad, and I will go. You, will give you the go to see where do you think the learning approach is. So uh, press the button, and one, two, three, go. Perfect. OK. Three, one, two, two, two. Two, OK, two, a lot of twos. OK, amazing. Let's see how you how you fare in this second challenge, right? So in this second challenge, learning is kind of in the middle. It, we tend to think it's in the two. It's a, it, it seems really human oriented, but it's not as intrinsic as you might think. It's a little bit more extrinsic. Why? Why, why should I say that the learning approach is extrinsic? Because please think about your years in school. 
most of the things you did in a school were not about, about learning stuff, were about getting grades, were about being evaluated. You were diagnosed constantly and you were trying to get those grades up. You were not learning because of intrinsic rewards. You were, you were being extrinsically pushed towards learning and you were being asked to learn things that you didn't want to learn. And that's something that actually keeps happening. The corporate world wants to train people and when they uh, when they say okay I, i'm sending this training course and no one is taking it it's because no one wants to do that in an intrinsic way they don't want to train in that information so we have a lot of mandatory courses and a lot of things that people have to do in education and if you you came here voluntarily to this work workshop so we are in a, that's why i say it's a kind of mixed reality because in a sense you're intrinsically driven to understand gamification, and that's, that gives me an edge because you already are open-minded about this process. But if you were forced to be here, you might be, you, may, you might be trying to shut down this information, right? So the learning approach is not as intrinsic as it should be. We like to learn intrinsically, but when we teach other people, we don't use an intrinsic approach necessarily. We use, uh, as it, uh, we, we measure the assistance and we, we gave failing grades to those that don't comply. And we have all these mechanisms that are really behavioral based in a sense. So it's not as up there as, as we wish it was. So number two, we would love that, but no, it's I don't not. Okay, so now the motivational approach. The motivational approach uh, is, remember, as a definition, is trying to tap into the intrinsic systems of motivation of the human beings. So it has to be up there, right? It has to be up there. The, the question is, how systemic is the motivational approach? Is only human oriented or can it be systemic oriented? So again, press a number and I will count up to three. So one, two, three, go. Okay, three, one, two, one, two. <laughs> Perfect, a lot of twos and ones. Okay, so one of the things as game designers we like to do to actually create learning is create a scenarios where people will tend to fail. 80% of the time you're playing games, you're actually failing. Games teach, teach you how to fail. Things that in our real human world, we tend to avoid because of the consequences, right? So uh, me as a game designer, I like to do this kind of stuff as well in my workshops. So actually it's not number one and number two, it's actually number four. It's really systemic oriented. Why? Why is it so systemic oriented, the motivational approach? Because it's not just about understanding your motivations. It's about changing the system to meet those motivations. I cannot motivate you if I don't change the system to go along with that motivation, right? So if a school doesn't motivate you and I understand how human works and how I should motivate people, I should change the way the rules of the system around that school. I cannot just say, hey, let's go people, let's, let's be motivated you want to learn. No, I need to actually change the way we learn. And one of the things I've been doing a lot in the educational sector is actually changing the way our teachers give class, right? So I try to make them more interactive and more uh, feedback oriented and a lot of things that usually are not. And this is hard because it means they have to change the way they approach the design process of giving a class. They have to change the system. So the motivational approach is really systemic. It's really systemic, it's really important. I remember I told you about Facebook. Facebook was a system built from scratch that changed a lot of people and almost all technology works like that. When a technology is adopted, it creates a new systemic rule set. Right, so when phones uh, were evolving, each time a phone evolved, it changed our way of perceiving things and the, uh, the way of, that we interact with our world. So it needs to change the system to actually motivate, right? 
But there is the, the systemic approach. The systemic approach, remember, is I just change the system. I just want to change the system. So where would this one be? Of course, it's system oriented, right? It has to be system oriented. Uh, we're changing the system per se. But again, how intrinsic versus extrinsic can it be? So again, press your number and one, two, three, four. And Okay, three, 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 two, two, two. Okay, so we are in the middle. Okay, a lot of threes, a, little, a lot of twos. Uh, it must have some intrinsic value. Let's see. And yeah, again, that's great. Okay, you're getting the hang of this. You are learning and changing your brains in a way here. So yeah, so the systemic approach is tends to be more extrinsic than intrinsic. It's really in the... In, in, it's in a way uh, really close to the intrinsic part because the evaluation that we do around our, 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 our ch behavior changes can be evaluated by our intrinsic drivers and we can actually change for good after a systemic change. That can happen, that can happen, but it's still really extrinsic because I'm not trying to change you by understanding your needs, but by changing all the aspects of the system, all the rule sets around the system. So if I want, for example, to change a company from a um, regular approach to, 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 its, uh, to its processes, I wanted to change mm -hmm. to, for example, uh, I want to change it to, to an agile uh, company. The first thing I need to do is change, overhaul all the system and change the system so that people will have to adapt. The problem with this systemic approach is that it creates heavy reaction. People will react heavily to this approach. People will not want to change a Sicily and it will create a lot of short-term pain. That, that short-term pain can endure if the, 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 the changes in the system are for worse or it can go down as people understand the values of the new system, if they can adapt and feel like this new system actually works better. So a lot of people that have been transformed into a more agile company, for example, they then start professing their love for agile, right? Because they have seen it work and when it works. But it can happen that a lot of other people start starts hating agile, right? So we need to understand that only changing the system will create heavy reactions and heavy emotional reactions because it's still not, not really human centered. So now the bias approach, where could the bias approach be? Remember, this is the behavioral economists trying to solve your problems by narrowing your uh, choice spectrum, by giving you choices that they actually know more or less how you will react to them. They want to predict your choice making, right? So in terms of the bias approach, where do you think it is? One, two, three, or four. So let's see. One, two, three, go. Okay, three, 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 four, four, three. Okay, amazing. So you can recognize now easily that this is an extrinsic approach. So you're not pay, placing any ones and twos. So yeah, perfect. You're, you now recognize the idea be, between intrinsic and extrinsic better. I like it. A amazing. Now let's see where it is. So the bias approach is not as systemic as we would really want it to be. Why? Because in terms of the, uh, the, the bias approach, it's really close to the behavioral approach. It tends to be more intrinsic in a way because it tends to understand how our cognitive process works. So it tends to try to understand what would we choose to feel right about our choices. So it, it tries to create less reaction, especially if you use notches, for example, the, the idea of the notch is that it must be a decision that's not uh, coercive, that's, that's not obligatory, that you can actually opt out from the notch. And that gives a little bit more of sense of, of an intrinsic value. It's actual, it's not really intrinsic. It's a false choice. And a false choice is never as intrinsic as a real choice, but it gives you the sense of choice, which takes it a little bit up, but it's not as systemic oriented. 
Why? Because the behavior, the, the bias approach tries to change little bits of the information spectrum, but doesn't try to change the rule set as a whole. They don't try to change how things work. They just want to place some stickers and some informational things that will make you make different choices in the same system. So it does change the system more than the behavioral approach, but it still it doesn't overhaul the system. It tries to use the same system that, that already exists and change only the informational space of the user. So it's not so far as to say it's a four. No, it doesn't change the system that much, but it is on the extrinsic part. Okay, now uh, number six, we are on the last one, persuasive approach. Where would the pre persuasive approach be? So, you know, in a, in a regular, um, if I were giving this, this, this conference in an efficient way and not in a gamified way, I would have just showed you the, the slide with all the things in this place and would explain why they're there. But I like this idea of you're making choices again, right? So you're making choices, you're first creating a hypothesis, you're evaluating that hypothesis, and then you're giving me your speculation. And after that, I give you feedback. And you decide, you evaluate my feedback, and you decide if I'm right or wrong. Maybe sometimes you're saying, I'm, I'm not totally sure, or sure, I don't agree. That's great. That's what real change tries to create, that, that internal uh, cognitive process. So let's see here what happens. So again, one, two, three, go. Where would be the persuasive mm -hmm. approach? Okay, so two, 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 three, one, one. Two, 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 three, one, one, two. Okay, okay. One. Okay, so remember, remember who you are, Simba. Remember, the persuasive approach is about changing the way people think, right? But without changing the system per se. So it's really a three. It's really a three. It's totally human based. It's what I remember when when the when my, when my significant other says I love punk rock and I say okay I've never think about punk rock but I start hearing punk rock and I say okay yeah I love it and I change my way of thought you're not changing the spectrum of how the musical system works at all you're not changing anything you're just changing the individual in a from an emotional level so what I want you to see is that we have to different axes, one that's emotional dependent and that what's, that's systemic dependent, system dependent. What does this mean? If in the, in, the upper, uh, in, the, in the upper sector, the persuasive and the motivational approach, if I take away the emotion or people change, people change over time and they change their ways of viewing things, if I take the emotion related to that activity, the activity will lose its motivational value people will stop doing the activity because it's based on what I want to do. If I stop wanting to do that, if I change my emotional ways of thinking about that, if, for example, people that played a lot when they were young, one of you said, I played a lot, I'm not playing that much, it's because you have changed your emotional relationship to games. Uh, it does, it's not a bad thing, it's just, okay, Video gaming, not so much. Maybe I'm more engaged in other things that I'm doing right now, and I don't have as much time for video games. I'm not so emotionally invested. So you change your drives. You change your way of being. So if you want to change from up there, you need to actually understand the emotional element behind decision making. But in the, in the lower part of change, what do we have? We have a more system dependent, uh, where a, a more systemic dependent motivational approach and motivate change approach, sorry, uh, where if I change the system, the behaviors will change as well. So if I take the system away, if I take all the rewards away, if I change the system again, again, behaviors will change. So in a way, we want a little bit more to change the upper part of the behavioral spectrum if we do really want to create change. The lower part of the spectrum can help us design behaviors, control behaviors, but it won't change. The, remember, change is a cognitive process, not a behavioral process. So I can change my behaviors a lot if the system changes, but that doesn't mean that I'm changing. In the, my underlying cognition is not changing. I'm just 
making different choices. So the bonus round is where is gamification, mm -hmm. right? So I want you to think really hard, where could gamification be? And many of you will be saying, oh, well, of course, he's selling us gamification. It must be in the upper right corner. Gamification is a design spectrum. And I draw it like this. It depends on the design. Gamification can be all over the place. You can have behavioral gamification that is really based on rewards and reward cycles, where you want to give badges and points and create leaderboards and create all kinds of recognition systems and the avatar and everything just to move along your behavior without changing your cognition, just giving you choices that change the way you behave without changing the way you feel or are. And that's done a lot. And this is the approach I don't like. This is why I don't like this approach. So there's a lot of crappy gamification out there. And it has failed, like Samsung Nation failed uh, a long time ago. It failed because it, have a, it had a behavioral approach. If you check other things, look at this. The, the meaningful approach can be as meaningful as you want it to be, depending on how uh, hard you think about changing the system and the motivation and everything there. Uh, but it's really curious that if you think, for example, in, of an app like Waze, and you think of gamification, people will think about the lower left corner. That's the bias that we have built around gamification and this is a problem. Because we think that gamification should have clear game elements. So I have this progression bar that makes my car go from a baby to a king. So that's gamification and I have a level. So I am a Waze Knight with 2,345 points and my rank is number 456. That's game design. Actually, it's not. I call this the gamification fallacy because game designers didn't invent points, didn't invent progress bars, didn't invent rankings, didn't invent level ups. We didn't invent any of those things. They pre-existed game design. Game designers think about the system, the mechanisms, the mechanics, not the interface features. So this one is really, it can really lead to really bad behavioral, behavioral approaches. But if you think about ways, ways is actually gamified in a more profound level. If you see ways, how the menus interact and how they display and how the icons are built and how they're animated, all this comes from understanding uh, gaming platforms and how their interfaces work. And when you have a progress bar and an estimated time for arrival, and it gives you sometimes choices where it says you can go here or here, it, it, it still has a lot of behavioral approach because it says two minutes less uh, using this, this route. Right, so that's be, that's that comes from behavioral economics because uh, game designers use behavioral economics. We use the whole spectrum. That's the idea, right? But most of the things we try to incorporate in terms of how you create decision making when it gives you the routes, when the choices that you can make, all of that has a lot in common with game design, and that's invisible for the for the player. It's 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 not as uh, as explicit as checking a scoreboard, a level, um, an avatar, all these other things. So Tinder, for example, the gamification. Yeah, it changes the system, the way people date it by changing the rules of dating, right? But it, do, it, it does it by understanding that the core principle about around dating is that there's a lot of uncertainty of not knowing the other people, what the other people think about me. So they eliminate that barrier, that pain, that motivational pain of not knowing what the other people think about it, about me, by creating this little game of matches. And when you create a match and you receive a match, you, you break the first barrier. And that's why people use LinkedIn as much as they did. And it was a kind of more meaningful gamification with a lot of behavioral approaches that uh, if, 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 if Tinder is not rewarding enough for you and you fail a lot in Tinder, well, you leave Tinder, of course. But there are a lot of couples that have found themselves their mates through, uh, through Tinder, right? And that's a gamification approach that's not quoted as gamification as much. It has all the right paradigms. So please don't. This is the first thing you have to, to understand here. The, the first thing I want you to understand here is this please don't, okay? So if you think change as behavioral change, 
you will start creating rewarding cycles and nudges. And that won't change no one. <laughs> you won't change anyone by doing these kind of things. You will create behaviors, but those behaviors will start an extinction process because our brain will try to fight back these kind of things. When they become repetitive, our brain tends to generate less dopamine over time and we hate repetition. And so if you start a rewarding cycle, it will work for three, four months. And then if you, if you dosify your reward system, it can last longer, but you have to dosify your reward system or people will leave the system. And we have to understand that gamification was born uh, from casual gaming, from these companies that created these black black hat mechanics to keep you engaged that were really manipul manipulative to make you, to monetize you. And we started using those same techniques in the real world. And this is really complex because those techniques last don't last for long. And when they stop working, people will revert back to their previous behaviors because the notch, the pressure you have to change your behavior will start to dissipate. If I don't want your reward, I can ignore it. I can ignore the systemic pressure. So why should I change, right? And this is one of the things that it's being doing, it's being done really bad in gamification design. So all this introduction, all this giving you all these ways of change and everything I did just now was a big argument on why you must be really careful when you approach gamification because there are a lot of consultants and a lot of people designing this kind of gamification and it will work for um, short-term processes for example gamified workshop uh, okay if it's a two-hour workshop give badges and give rewards and do everything you want because the workshop will be over before the extinction of the behavior. But you will not change people. You will give them a great short-term experience, but it won't create long-lasting change. If I want to create long-lasting change, I have to go beyond that and understand that gamification designers, the great gamification designers, and I'm not talking just about me, I'm talking about Jukaichu, I'm talking about Andrzej Marcelski, I'm talking about Dave Chandras. There's a lot of great people, Marigo Raptopoulos, Monica Cornetti, there are a lot of amazing people doing great things, and they do them by trying to understand the whole concept around human motivation and human change. And this means understanding about motivation theories, attention theories, cognitive theories, info engineering, systemic design, behavioral design, neuroscience, semiotics, for example. Semiotics is really important for game designers, right? So all these things, you can create a core, a, a core idea of how we work if we understand all of this. And we don't just focus on, oh, okay, behavioral science. I will be an expert on behavioral science. I have for a living to study all these things all the time. I have to be working on all these things. Right now, I'm working a lot with cognitive theories and attentional theories. That's right now what I'm trying to research a lot because attention and motivation are really related. And that this is something that game designers use a lot in a, in a, in a, in a really interesting way, right? So, but in the core, why is this gamification? Because in the core, we are taking our knowledge from the principles of game design. So if you want to understand gamification as I do, gamification would be a design discipline. It's like uh, talking about uh, graphic designers or industrial designers. It's a design discipline where the success rate is not dependent on the discipline. It's, you cannot ask if gamification works or not. You need to ask if that gamification designer can make it work or not, like a great gamification graphic designer or a great industrial designer versus a regular industrial designer. So it's about how you use all these principles in your design process. And game designers are designers per se, and they have been working around all these things for almost a century right now. So we have a lot of knowledge base to understand. We, we, I say game designers are like practical psychologists because they're trying to change the way people interact with their system and are always reading people's reactions to tweak the system. And they understand that any small tweak to a system can have a big behavioral change and a big experiential change. Anything, 
a little a, a card that is too powerful breaks again. That's just that's the only thing you need to break again. So we have been working really hard on trying to understand human motivation. And this is what the tutorial is about. Okay. So right now, do you have any questions until this point? Do you have anything you want to, to say, to ask? Too much information? No, seem reasonable to me. No questions from me, at least. Okay, amazing. Okay, perfect. So again? Yeah, so far so good, thanks. You're free to, oh, perfect. Amazing. So uh, I hope, again, I hope I have created some uh, cognitive dissonance in you. You have failed in those first, in some of those first uh, challenges, but see how our brain learns through failure. It learns better through failure than from success, right? Success creates confirmation bias, but failure creates cognitive dissonance. And that's one of the things that game designers try to do a lot, make you fail. We create interesting failure states as a living, we want you to fail. So now, uh, we I want you to go to the level one. So I said, okay, the thing we have to do is try to create this both human and systemic approach. I have heard a lot of people talking about it has to be a human approach, human-centered design. And there are other people that still work with a heavy system, systemic-centered design, system-centered design. And actually think we have to work with both. As game designers, we work with both. We need to understand the human level and the, and the systemic level, right? So if we want to understand the human level, the best approach is to understand it through the motivational scope. That's the one that was right up and right uh, and to the right. If we want to create that kind of behavioral changes, change, we need to understand motivation. And so most of gamification consultants work first on a motivational basis and use the self-determination theory. Most of them use the self-determination theory as a base to build up um, an, an idea of motivation to work with your players. So there's, there has been a lot about this. So you can find things, sorry. Uh, so you can uh, find things like, um, I lost my train of thought, it will come back. Uh, okay, motivation theories. Ah, okay, so uh, you see, for example, the, the, the four player types of Richard Bottle, and you will see that each player type uh, is something connected to a, to a core driver, to a way we play, something like that. So I want to show you the BEM approach to this to, to drivers and profiling, understanding that this part of the human-centered design. So again, let's load. So here's a little tip for you. So behavioral approaches narrow the choice spectrum. Remember that, we talked about that. Behavioral approaches are trying to narrow your choice spectrum. The motivational approach amplifies it to a comfortable degree because too many choices are not great but it tries to give you choices. That's what the motivational approach tries to do, right? So if you want a more behavioral approach because you don't want people to fail, it's better a behavioral approach. If you cannot uh, let people fail in a secure environment, you need a more behavioral approach. But if you are willing to let your people change, really, you need to use a more motivational approach. So how do we do this? So this is like my, the, my first idea behind the BM. I took a lot of these motivational frameworks. I took Octalysis and I took Hexad and I took the self-determination theory and I took a lot of things. And from there, what I did was um, trying to create my own model of motivation through the scope of my mind as a game designer. So it begins with self-determination theory. There's a lot of here around self-determination theory, but there are other things that I, I understood as a game designer that I needed to incorporate into the model. So I work around seven drivers, seven core drivers. So we have this heptagon that has these drivers and the organization of the drivers have a meaning, but I'm not going to go deeper into that. But what I want you to know is that all of these drivers are intrinsic drivers. I don't have any model about around extrinsic approaches or black hat approaches. The, those are drivers, things that you want to fulfill in a way, and you want to fulfill them in a contextual way. So 
if you are doing one activity, you might be really mastery oriented, but if you're doing other activity, you might be more empowerment and control oriented. So this is not a profiling system in the sense of the person of a personality test, where if you take a quick test, it will tell you how you think. No, motivation is really contextual and it's really unpredictable in a sense, which is something that might scare you. So I will tell you how not to be scared around this process of design. So the first thing is understanding that each of these drivers have two sides. There are two sides on, of, of the coin of each driver. In terms of, in academic terms, we call them the motivational direction. And the direction can be, there are three directions, but I won't talk about one of them. It's uh, avoidance, approach, and apathy. Apathy is when you can ignore things without you caring. For example, uh, I think it was Robert that said, I don't mind video games, but I don't play them. That would be apathy. Apathy is, I don't care, right? So they can exist. I don't have an emotional reaction toward them. It will not change my way of being. That's good, no problem. That's the idea, right? But you can have avoidance or approach motivation. For example, toward games, pe some people want to avoid playing games as much as they can, right? So that, that creates a psychological pain. An avoidance driver means that you have a psychological pain that you want to get rid of, that you don't want to uh, be on the position of having to endure that pain. So no, no, no games for me. I, I don't like playing games. Okay, if you don't like playing games, we will not be creating games as a whole. The gamification doesn't have to create games per se. It's around the design principles, not around creating games as a, as, a, uh, as a concept. So, of course, there's the approach, the approach method. And the approach is, if I understand that a lot of the people that are being, are being born from the 2000 and up, from the, yeah, from the 2000 and up, most of these people that are entering the workplace began their learning process by having a real, um, attachments to video games. So I might want to try to use more gamey things for them because that might attach better to their approach driver, right? So all of these drivers have an approach and avoidance and apathy is just, I don't care, right? So I, I really want to work around avoidance and approach. We need to understand both of them because if I only work around approach, I will not have the whole spectrum of things. Whenever I do a gamification project, the first thing I start asking the people that want to create change is why people are reluctant to change. Why people have this pain that make, makes them resistant to change. Because if I don't understand that, I cannot design around that problem. And change resistance is a real problem. If I'm resisting to change, it's because it creates uh, a lot of cognitive effort, for example. I have to change a lot of things and I have to uh, use my neurons in a way my brain doesn't want to. And I need to understand what's happening back there so I can create motivation because motivation is measured not only by direction, but also by energy. I want to know how much energy a person will apply to avoidance or to approach. If there's a lot of energy towards avoidance, that's really that's really a problem. Mm. It's almost unchangeable. It's almost unchangeable. If you have this kind of scenarios with, where someone tells you games are the worst. I have studied games and games do an awful damage and I, I hate it. Okay, if you talk about games with that passion, I won't be able to change you, right? So change has an spectrum a probability spectrum. And I need to understand that probability spectrum to try to amplify it as much as I can. So first, let's talk about these drivers, having this in mind. So first I have the hedonism and pleasure driver. Hedonism and pleasure is, is it's about understanding aesthetic pleasure. Aesthetic in the way uh, the Greeks understand aesthesis, that is, the things that I feel with my senses, with all my senses. And we know there are more than five senses. I mean, proprioception and uh, balance and a, a, lot of, a lot of things that we feel, right? So we want to find aesthetic pleasure. If you see this image, this image can compel a lot of emotions uh, to you. And a lot of players play video games just for the graphics just to be immersed in these amazing worlds. And if you don't play video games, maybe you saw uh, Avatar, the 
the, the movie, right? And you saw all this world, an amazing world, or the aesthetic pleasure of watching the Lord of the Rings. And, you know, fantasy has a, a really aesthetic approach to their, um, to their design process, right? So how I can create things that are awesome to the senses, right? But also it can be a Michael Bay movie where if everything explodes because explosions are create attraction in a way that in, in, a, in a really hedonistic way, we like to see things being destroyed. We like cataclysm movies just to see how the tornado rips everything apart. We like that, right? And that's aesthetic pleasure in its core. But we avoid aesthetic disgust. And this is really hard to understand because uh, aesthetic disgust can take a lot of forms. I, for example, cannot watch things like Rick and Morty. I don't know if you watch Rick and Morty, but I cannot uh, watch that cartoon because I, it's too grotesque for my aesthetic pleasures. So I can see them, even if they're great, I cannot see them just because of the graphics, right? So we create a lot of judgment around what we feel in our senses. That's why we have this idea of pain, because when we are sick and where we are in pain, we search for help. We go and ask for help. We go to the doctor when we are really sick. We, that's the problem with uh, pre preventive medicine, that people are not feeling any hedonistic drive, so they don't want to place the effort. But if something is really troubling you, you will do the effort. If your room is too hot, you will open the window. If it's too cold, you will put something on. But you want to feel comfortable, for example. That's homeostasis. So hedonism is one of the drivers that you won't see a lot in other uh, gamification frameworks or other uh, motivational theories, but that I, under, I understand that it's really important to actually create engagement. So we always work on trying to give our best on the uh, aesthetic pleasure of the gamification projects we do, for example. We have a whole design team just there to create a great aesthetic experience. And it's amazing, but even our clients, when they start seeing the interfaces, mo most of the time they criticize how it seems, how it looks, and not how it works. That's something that we have to work around a lot. Uh, I don't like that color. Uh, that color is not part of the brand colors. Okay, let's change it. And it has to do a lot with that visual aspect, for example. So that's one way of understanding design. The other way is around driver of efficiency. The driver of efficiency is our need to manage resources and avoid impatience. So what it does, it seeks optimization and effort reduction. It seeks optimization and effort reduction. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, we, 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 when we talk about resources, resources are anything that we feel we can manipulate to transform into other things, to transform them. So energy, work, money, time, all of, of these things can be optimized, right? So there are a lot of people just working on how to create more benefits with less effort, because effort is energy, and we want to keep our energy levels to the minimum. When do we use energy to create different kinds of stuff? When we are not impatient. Impatience creates this sense of let's take a shortcut. A lot of games have different kinds of shortcuts and things so you can move along more quickly. For, so for example, some games, you have to walk from one town to another until you reach level 10 and then you have a horse. And when you reach level 30, you have stones of teleportation. And these shortcuts create a sense of, oh, I worked hard for this optimization. I, they didn't give it to me. I worked hard for that optimization. And this idea of productivity and work and of earning is really, uh, is really created through this sense of efficiency, right? So this is really important because the way we manage efficiency has a lot of cognitive biases. Here is where behavioral approaches can work really well on understanding, creating predictions around how people will work around different things, because that's what behavioral economists do, understanding the decision-making process around uh, using resources. And this is really an important part uh, of game design because in game design, we use resources. We create games based on economic engines. That's a big concept in game design. Then we have related, relatedness and empathy. In relatedness and empathy, it's, this is about our need for social bonding and belonging. 
It controls our social reasoning and emotions and avoids social awkwardness and shame. This is really important because this is one of the reasons uh, you should avoid leaderboards if you can, if you don't know how to use them. Leaderboards are, are double-sided swords. And it's really hard to get them right. It's really hard to get them right. It's really easy to get them right in really competitive scenarios where people, all the people that are participating are great players, like in sports, in professional sports, they work well there, right? But in other scenarios, for example, in education, leaderboards can actually be more harmful than they can be great. There's a theory, theory that's called the Accomplishment Goal Theory by Carl Dweck that actually explains in educational context how having a leaderboard, a comparison system where you can see how others are better, are faring better than you, actually demotivate you, actually can create mo avoidance motivation. So if I'm not good in this game, if I cannot reach the top positions, why do I play it? There's no uncertainty. There's no way I can reach up to there. So leaderboards, I prefer position tables like in Mario Kart, where you have like racing cars and the positions are changing all the time, or board games. In board games, they have a lot of leaderboards, but it's about uh, changing positions quickly and swapping positions quickly. But other kinds of leaderboards where you know who's going to win, like for example, in sales forces, that motivates those that are up there and demotivates all those that are down there. So it's really hard to create uh, this kind of, of, of drive, if you create social shame, this is because of social shame, you know other people are watching the leaderboard, you know other people are seeing that you're not up for the task, and that's awful, you don't want that. And social awkwardness, that's something that you don't want, that you don't know how to speak to someone, that you don't know what other people will say. One of the really hard things to do is make people ask questions or give comments in workshops. It's hard to do because it creates a kind of social awkwardness, right? So a way of creating social awkwardness is, for example, if I tell you, ask me a question. Do you see the silence? How you're reacting to the silence? You're asking mm. me, please go on. Please don't do this. We, we hate those uh, awkward silences, right? And that comes from our relatedness and empathy uh, driver. And, but we give a lot of effort into creating social bonding and belonging. Uh, if you see competition in games actually revolve around uh, creating more relatedness than actually, actually hard competition. Board games, for example, create competition, but they're more about social bonding. It's about making fun of what the other has said, playing Pictionary and just laughing because it, it doesn't make sense. And it's actually more about the social bonding and belonging of being able to be part of the group that's playing the game than around competition per se. We are social beings. We are cooperative beings by essence. We love cooperation. We love Cooperation, if the cooperation doesn't drag us down, like if I'm great at something and the others, I have a, the worst team ever, I hate that. But if I have a good team, cooperation actually drives a lot of our motivations. And we have this idea of social reasoning because social reasoning doesn't respond to logic, right? Like gift giving. If you have seen the Big Bang Theory, for example, Sheldon Cooper hates gift giving because he understands it from a more rational point of view. And gift giving is senseless, but we do it because it creates social bonding and that's really important for us. So understanding that games try to create these social bondings uh, by creating player interaction. It doesn't have to be competition. It has to be interaction. That players can chat, that can players can interact through the game, that in a chess game, I move a piece and the other player says, hmm, mm, I don't like that. that that's, that's social interaction. So. It's about interaction and empathy, about being able to feel what other people feel, about to feel what the characters feel, because that's how you create relatedness in single player games. It's about creating characters that you can feel in love with. That's all built around this driver. Then we have the driver of mastery and progress. The driver of mastery prog progress revolves around our need for self-reliance and competence. It is measured by a skill progression and self-efficacy. The idea is I want to understand if I can do stuff. I want to see the potential growth in me. 
It's not about being a mastery. Uh, the, the driver is called mastery or competence. I don't like it that much, uh, but it's the best way to, to create a relation between the driver and the, and the theory. So I call it mastery and progress, but I put this, this progress particle there in the name because it's not about being a master. Actually being a master in something can actually demotivate you sometimes. If you're too good for something, you stop, you stop doing it because there's nothing else to learn. But the idea of mastery I, I, is more in the sense of the potential mastery. It's more in the sense of I can do this or I can't. I think I can do it. And I avoid effort, effortful learning and zones of incompetence. When I think I'm not good at something, I will try to avoid it as much as I can. So if you feel you're not great at video games, for example, that might make you not play video games. Video games are not games. Right, so gamification is really related to video games in the minds of the people. But when I talk about sports or board gaming or other kinds of games, people actually play a lot more than they know they're playing. And the way they address most of the things in their real life seems like playing in some manners, right? So having a business is kind of playing, right? It, it, it has all the elements around play with higher consequences, that's the problem. But it, it actually builds around that idea of, if I, I feel I'm a great businessman, well, I will continue being a businessman. I, I feel that mastery. And I want to know, for example, uh, buying a cell phone. Buying a cell phone is about, okay, I, I, I use the same brand because using the other brand, I don't know how to make it work. I feel incompetent. And that creates a barrier to change actually, right? But if I still, feeling competence, I can still start reducing the barrier of change, for example. This is really important in terms of how to create change. Mastery is one of the great barriers to change. People don't feel competent and feel they have to avoid the thing that we want them to do. So the learning process is, okay, I don't know anything about it. Uh, they're making me take a course. I don't know if I will be able to do it. I hate this. We start with this emotional hate, hatred. So we need to design around that process. We need to make people feel like they can do it. This is really important in gamification. And then we have empowerment and control. Empowerment control is uh, works around the idea of dominance, power, influence, and certainty. Certainty for me is the key word here. We want to have things that are certain for us. We want to know that we have the skill to make this thing work. We need to feel like we have control over things, right? So we want to know, for example, think of how you organize your, your room or your house, right? So the way you organize it is in a way that you can control things. You want to be able to know if I need a knife, where is the knife? Right. So if you are in a house that's not your own and you need a knife, you need to ask for a knife. You don't have the certainty. You don't have the control. You need to rely on others. And that feels disempowerment, disempowering, because if the other pe person won't help me, I can't do anything. I have to start searching all over the place. But in my own house, I have control around everything. So if, I, if you have a maid or you have a, a, a partner, a significant other or someone that moves things from the places you'd like them to be, you start creating social tension. You start saying, ah, why did you move that, right? So the problem with dominance is that in a real world, we cannot dominate over everything. We just can't. The uh, relationships, uh, like amorous relationships, loving relationships, have a lot of tensions, mainly because of this driver because they cannot be, they, they don't want to give control to the other party, to the other person, right? Negotiation is about a lot of, it's a lot about empowerment. So if I'm a big company and there's a small company, there's a, a, a sense of empowerment where the small company feels that they have to give a lot. For example, people that are just graduating from college or universities, they tend to let their first employers do anything they want with them because they feel less empowered. And they want to create empowerment by creating a curriculum vitae, a, a labor experience that gives me certainty. If I do well in my work, if I have a promotion, that gives me more certainty. And we love to have control over things. The problem is we can't control them all. And that creates uh, this, this sense of avoidance, right? So we don't want submission or responsibility. And that's a problem because many of the things that give power also give responsibility. And this is a really hard uh, thing to, to actually 
and to grip with this, uh, uh, you know, empowerment workshops, you need to be more empowered, you, may, you need to make more choices. But then you get to your workplace and say, if I make the wrong decision, my boss will be all over me. I don't want that. I don't want that responsibility. So I prefer to ask my boss, how do you want to do it? And I have certainty that if I do it that way, it will be my boss's responsibility. The blame will fall on my boss. And that's something that people want to do. They want to give responsibility to something else. We have this external locus of responsibility. We don't want to feel that it's our fault. Okay, that's called the self-serving bias and it's an egoistic bias. And we have it, we all have it in a way. But we have a driver that compensates for empowerment in a way. They clash, remember I, I told you this, it's called the clash of drivers for a, for a reason. And I want you to start thinking around what does this mean? What does the clash of drivers mean? And here you can see I, you can see this in a, in, a, in a sense in a little bit. So when you when you have games, there are two categories of games: games of skill and games of chance. Games of skill rely on certainty, power, mastery, control. Mm -hmm. Games of chance rely on discovery, on novelty, on exploration, experimentation, safe uncertainty, and that's the key word here: safe uncertainty. So. The thing is, we our brains want to discover things. They want to taste new things, but we are scared of doing them if there are high risks. For example, if you go to a restaurant and it's a classy restaurant that really serves really good food, but it's really expensive, you have a tendency to use your driver of empowerment on control. You will say, I want to eat something that I know is good because it's so expensive that if I, ask for, for some food and I don't like it, I will feel like I lost a lot, right? So you need certainty. But if I place that same scenario, that same food in a free buffet, right? Where you can taste anything you want, you might find yourself experimenting more, discovering more. You, you don't feel unsafe. You don't feel like you're losing a lot, right? So if you have, you can taste from small bits of food, that's better because if you don't like something, maybe the next thing I will like. And that creates exploration and discovery and creativity because I can mix things together and see how they work, right? So yeah, the, the, the French fries with the, the ketchup and uh, let's see how it works. But now with uh, a milkshake and you can try to experiment things and create, start being creative uh, because you want to avoid familiarity routines and familiarity create a stagnant, you become stagnant and you don't like that feeling. You really don't like to feel stagnant. So when people are in a routinary work, they, dream, they daydream about creating their own business, uh, doing their own stuff, changing work, but then their efficiency driver clashes and says, okay, wait, that's not productive. I will be wasting a lot of time while I'm getting the new job and I will be losing money, money and that feels unempowering and I feel I'm losing control. I don't know what will happen. It's certainty with high risks. So this is why I'm telling you these drivers clash because when you have a pull from one driver, you have another pull from other drivers. That's what makes us so imperfect but so beautifully unpredictable in a sense. So behavioral economics is about finding predictable ways of understanding mm. us. Motivational theory is understanding the variety. It's understanding that we are really different. And that's why epic identity and purpose is my umbrella driver. It works in conjunction with all other drivers because it builds around this idea of heroism, of culture, cultural values, tribal sense, the idea that we create tribes around people that share our knowledge, right? LinkedIn is a tribal way of connecting with people, right? Uh, personal identity, we create personal identities through social media, so through the uh, pictures I take of myself and post them to others. I'm creating identity by the things I buy for my room and the, uh, the, the, the um, I don't know, uh, the, yeah, the postcards I send, everything that, that in a way uh, shows my values. So if I like to, I don't know, 
fly to other cities and other countries and I like to explore the world, I will probably have a map or will have Google Maps in my bookmarks and I will talk about a lot about um, what the things I the things I have done when I was uh, in this trip or, or, or another that creates a, that, that creates a sense of identity and value and we need to have this idea of value of self value again because we have this uh, we have high regards for our, for ourselves we want to feel like things go with our own values and there's this shift that Daniel Pink talked about around um, profit based companies shifting to purpose based companies where people feel like what they do are is actually contributing to something they like that they want to contribute to and this is really important again this is really important because it can help people drive uh, change or drive behaviors in a meaningful way and the problem is again with change if i try to change people in a way that can uh, attack their identity values it will create resistance it will create resistance. So if you don't feel like the company should be this production machine that earns every penny at the best cost possible, and you hate that kind of machinery scenario, and you like other kinds of management, management 3.0 or that kind of things, and your company says, okay, we'll start a process of depuration of efficiency of, we will take choices away from you. You might start to create resistance to the company just because it's not aligned with your purpose. And again, all of these drivers are in constant clash with each other. Think about this. You're going to a museum and one person is efficient, efficient in, in, in its core driver around the museum. So efficient means that he wants to see everything he can in the time he has to see it. He wants to be really effective. He wants to go from room to room and spend the precise amount of time so he can be able to see everything. And it has a planned route because that creates efficiency. But you have a hedonistic person that really likes the aesthetic pleasure and they want to prolong the aesthetic experience. So you both go to the same museum and in the first room, in the first gallery, the tension starts because one of you will want to, okay, let's move along. Another one, wait, I'm watching the, this. I, I, I like to analyze this. And if one is based on mastery and understands the, the whole idea of art, he will start, start to lecture the others. And maybe the others don't want to be lectured about that. So it creates all these drivers create social tension in a way, and it creates inner tension. We need to take make choices that usually we have to balance the needs that it will satisfy with the pains it will create. And we are not in a perfect world, right? So Facebook, it started great by creating a lot of needs, right? Social needs, a lot of discovery, a lot of relatedness, a lot of hedonism. Uh, it created a lot of things by connecting people, empowerment, because you could connect to more people and get influence. And it gave people a lot of this. But then people start realizing Facebook is using my, da my, my data. And by using my data, they're taking my power away from me. I feel disempowered, disenfranchised. I have no voice. My data is used to manipulate me. I have no control. I have no certainty. And people start reacting towards that. I hate that people use my data without, that's my identity that creates this uh, damage to the identity core principle, right? So we're talking about gamification. I have been talking about motivation, but if you've seen all the images I have brought forward is the way game designers think about these drivers. We think about these drivers as a process of design. We need to understand that these drivers, this tension actually can be great for designing great experiences. We don't have to avoid that problem. We have to face it on. And how do we do it? by creating choice, by making people make decisions. Any question? Everything right? Yeah, very clear here. Perfect, clear. Okay, so clear until now. Um, so let's, uh, load this a little bit. Uh, so again, a tip. Uh, so player profiling 
shows different player styles. One of the things that we do in gamification is try to understand different player styles and these motivational frameworks help us understand that. How a person with different driver drivers around the context that we're working on will react to the change I'm trying to make and how can I make it meaningful for all these player types. So one of the things I do is I avoid trying to fo focusing on one driver because I if I focus on one driver, I will satisfy only one need. I will try to go around the problem trying to satisfy all seven drivers. So if I'm doing these courses uh, uh, on English, right, learning English, I will start checking each of these drivers and I will create a motivational map, right? So let's do a really small exercise here in the chat again really really quick exercise so let's say uh, let's help robert he works giving uh, english classes he has a company around that that idea and um he he wants to actually motivate people using gamification and we need to understand this kind of process right so let's think around this avoidance and approach drivers so i i will start up here in the chat by giving you a driver so we will start by hedonism. We, no, hedonism is a, a little bit harder. Let's just start by master. It'll be easier. So you to give me ideas of why people would approach the idea of becoming a master in English when they speak Spanish as a second language, right? Mastery, right? Mastery is not just knowledge. It's I want to become better on it. I want to really be great on it. But why would people avoid learning English because of mastery. So play some ideas in the chat. Let's try to figure out really small ideas because, you know, typing. But I, I want you to start thinking about this process. This is part of the play shop. I need you to just, let's avoid just having the knowledge. Let's try to create information, create something with that knowledge. So for example, in terms of mastery, what ideas can you have, right? If you want to say them by the microphone, it's fine as well. But so, so inter can you again, just explain what you want us to uh, like. What's okay. the question again? Yeah. yeah. So I, I want you to understand these drivers in the sense of of how I understand these drivers in the context of what I'm doing, right? A gamification approach is I need to understand the system. I need to understand the human being around that system and the motivational map around that system as it is. And if I'm learning, uh, I'm teaching English to Spanish speakers or other speakers, it doesn't have to be Spanish. Uh, and I want to try to check these drivers. The first driver I want you to check is the driver of mastery. Remember, mastery is about progression, about feeling the capacity to learn more stuff of a specialization and that kind of things. So what could lead a person to feel approached to learning English through the driver of mastery? That's what I want you to, to tell me, right? So for example, if you say interact with others, Robert, uh, to interact with others, I don't need mastery. I need just to have the basic level of English to be able to create, start creating interaction. So interact with others would be more related to relatedness. It's our, I want to have English because I want to communicate, right? Communicate and persuade people globally, okay? So if I want to persuade people globally, people might judge me by my quality of English. Right? Like I'm not a native English speaker. I try to do my best because if I start uh, speaking, uh, I might feel if I start speaking a little badly, <laughs> I might still, I might feel shame in a way, right? I will feel incompetent. So maybe I want to be master because I want to communicate globally with people and I want to do it with a level of persuasion and status. So that's right, Baron. That's, that's one way of understanding mastery, right? Any other way of understanding this? Mm. So, to migrate to a native speaking country where English proficiency assessment is assessed. Okay, for example, that's great, Mia. So if I need to migrate to another country, my English will be assessed. To get the things I need to do, I will have to have this B1 or B2 level or anything. You, 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 you will have this drive to try to pass the exam and by, but for passing the exam, I need to, to acquire the, the needed mastery. So that can move me through that uh, driver as well. Appearance of looking foolish in front of people with better skills. That's right, right? Again, and this is um, an avoidance driver, 
uh, uh, avoidance, a relation, uh, relatedness avoidance driver, but a mastery uh, approach driver. It, it has this synergy. I don't want to feel foolish. I don't, this is awkward for me that creates social embarrassment. So it has relationship with, with, with relatedness, but uh, that gives me a sense of why I should master the language, why I should practice the language more. Communicate directly with customers and other markets. Okay, depending on the type of customers and markets that I'm approaching, having better skills in the language will allow me to actually communicate better with them. So I will not have to ask all the time, what were you saying? I, I, I'm not sure, please repeat. So we, we don't want that. So that drives our need to better learn that second language. The ability to boldly interact with people without fear. Again, relatedness, there's a little bit of empowerment there, right? Fear is about the loss of control, right? It's about uncertainty. So if I can talk without fear, that gives me a sense of mastery and the sense of empowerment. It works around both the drivers. Masters new skills through English. Uh, yeah, for example, one of the, that's one, that was one of my drivers. I learned English in part because I wanted to be able to access a better knowledge, right? So uh, in Spanish, knowledge has become better <laughs> in a way. Uh, there have been publishable things in Spanish lately, but the best knowledge was when I was growing up in English. So I wanted to master these new skills and I needed to access high, a high level of English to actually understand what they were telling me. So that's a way of understanding also this, this idea. So you can see that there are a lot of things that I want, I naturally want in the system to, to do uh, to, I have the, the need to satisfy, and that's why there are a lot of people trying to learn English. But I need also to understand the avoidance part, is why would I not go and learn English in terms of avoidance? Why would I avoid learning English in terms of mastery, mastery avoidance? So what do you say? So thinking about approach is easier than avoidance sometimes, because we tend to judge people around their goals, but we don't, we don't notice as easily or as quickly their pains, right? So think about that. Feel vulnerable and incompetent. Mm. Okay, so the problem is if I feel I'm not progressing, I can feel incompetence. In languages, that's a big problem. It's a big problem. The feeling of incompetence is really, is really problematic because when you're learning a second language, you start understanding first. Uh, first, you can, you can receive information first, but you are really slow. So at actually think of incompetence here, right? So uh, in a, and if I don't feel like I'm progressing, that's bad. And in mastery, it's, this creates a particular problem. And that is that I feel like I need to spend a lot of time before I can get to a level where I actually feel comfortable speaking with other people. So the progression curve, the learning curve of this language of languages is really hard. So if I understand that, I understand why a lot of advertisers say that they can teach English in seven weeks or that kind of stuff, right? It, it appeals to that pain. It appeals to, it solves that pain in a way. So what I want to do as a gamification designer is trying to understand how can I solve that pain and how can I use my game design to allow people to understand how they're achieving these mastery goals. That's the main thing I want to do. I want to make people feel, feel less vulnerable and incompetent through the game design process. And I want them to feel like they're mastering new skills, like they're interacting with other people without fear, like that they're communicating directly with customers and their markets. Yeah. Um, but it is a full False premise. Which is a false premise, hey, Robert? Oh, basically telling people that you can learn a language in six weeks. Um, mm -hmm. so after after two or three academies or institutes, people that buy into that. Sorry, part of my English, part of my French. They buy into that crap. They basically realize, oh, this is not true, uh, and then they 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 actually go into this um, 
personal drama, like, no, 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 I'm not good enough to learn English. I think I won't ever learn English in my life. And in reality, is the institutes telling them it's a false, it's a false premise. We know that we need more time to learn a language than just six weeks. Yeah, that's true. And this helps me uh, explain two concepts. First, there's attraction, and then there's engagement. And attraction is the mother of engagement. Attraction, if there's not attraction, I cannot create a game engagement. I can have the best game possible. If people are not attracted to playing it, it will lose any power it can have. I need to create attraction. And expectancy campaigns and advertisement campaigns are, are all about attraction, about telling you how this will solve your problem. But engagement is about actually feeling that you are actually satisfying the need, right? If I don't feel like I'm satisfying the need, I will create resistance. And there's a, uh, there's a great theory that's called expectancy value theory that explains a lot around this problem. It's, it's really great. It's a really simple theory, but it explains how expectations and values shift over time. So you might enter with high expectation, but over time, you actually start measuring the value of that expectation. So if you watch a, a, a really crappy movie thinking it was going to be a great movie, you feel you create a lot of pain. It creates a lot of pain. You create a lot of resistance, right? You talk really bad about that movie, right? But it can happen the, the, the other way around. You have low expectancy and then it was amazing. And that, that curve is actually great to feel more empowered than it's, it was better than he thought, right? So the expectation and the value must align in a way that they actually or meet or the value is higher than the expectation. If not, that will create resistance to change. Again, that will create resistance. So that's right. That's the problem. I can advertise and create attraction around learning English in seven weeks and then um, make people feel disappointed with my program. And that's really hard. You feel you were losing your money. Those programs use behavioral economics to keep you in because they use the sunken cost fallacy. The sunken cost fallacy says that if you you have to spend some time doing something, you feel worse leaving it, uh, leaving it out of your life. Like stop doing that thing feels like uh, I, I, all that time was wasted. So if, I, if I've been in this program for five weeks and I still start feeling this is not uh, accomplishing my goals, but people tell, okay, you have five weeks, let's continue with the, with the, with the, with the system. People will tend to continue uh, the process just because they, don't want to feel like they lost money. And that, that's a manipul manipul manipulative behavioral approach. And this is really problematic. Behavioral approaches can have these bad effects. That's what we call a black hat design, actually. Black hat, black hat design are all these designs that use try to hack your vulnerabilities to make you make the choices I want, but you then start feeling manipulated. Right? That's the point. You feel like, this, this was not the best choice and I'm still here and I hate it. And that's the problem with that kind of, of design. So we don't want to do that. We, kind of, we want to actually try to improve the learning curve, create engaging experiences, and we can do this with all the drivers. And for English, we can understand that through mastery, but we can understand hedonism, for example. And there will be pleasure styles that will be moved to learn English, not because they want to be great at the language, but, but because they want to understand the language that they feel pretty. It happened to me with Italian. I took four semesters of Italian just because I wanted, I liked how the, the, the language sounded. Only because of that, only because of that. I, I didn't have plans to go to Italy or study in, Ita in Italy, or I didn't have to, anything to do with Italy in that moment, but I liked the, the language. And that was just hedonism. That was just hedonism. And I have forgotten almost all my Italian. That was many years ago and I haven't used it. Used it. But still, when I hear something in Italian, I, 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 I get this hedonistic sensation. I feel, okay, I, I can grasp a little bit of the language and I like how it feels. And many people enter English because they like how it, how it sounds, how poetry in English works, like William Blake. and all that kind of, it's not going to be that they feel is pretty. And we have to design for them. The gamification design should uh, also try to bring them in, right? In a way, and the game mechanics and the whole system will try to let you choose 
around those game styles. And here is where the idea of choosing becomes really important because we don't want to take agency away from our players. We don't create change by narrowing that scope through behavioral design. We want, if we want to create change, meaningful change, we need to tap into more intrinsic desires and satisfy those intrinsic desires. We need to understand how people can actually, through my game design, feel better with themselves. They need to feel like when they leave the game, they don't left because they were manipulated. They want to recommend the system. That's what we want to do in a gamification design. So this is part of the things I want you to understand. Um, this, the, this idea of working around drivers, uh, we, I create a lot of driver maps. Uh, and what I do is try to always work uh, around these driver maps with a team, never by myself, because my own biases will take a place there. Right, So I will try to see the world from my own perspective. So if you have more people in your team, try to bring them on, bring them on so they can give you fresh perspectives on how and why people can be motivated to do that kind of, uh, what, what you want to accomplish in terms of change, in terms of learning, cultural transformation, why can this be meaningful for different people and why it can, be, it can create resistance to other kinds of people. And when we have this map, we can see Start designing the system that map from the human approach. I start working on the systemic approach. That's the way I work around this problem. I don't start just creating mechanics. I don't start creating games. That's that, that, that's not. I just don't go. Okay, English. Okay, let create a game where people will talk and think about nouns and verbs and cards and let. when they are learning with other people that, that, that they know, for example, because it's easier for them to try to create a sm a small communication games between them to try to uh, improve the, the process. So that kind of things actually can improve motivation and you could create a game that helps people understand that that's a way of playing the game, not the only way. I will not create a mandatory design where you will have to play in a cooperative way. But if you want to, I will create a system to allow, allow that kind of driver, driver to emerge. And that's the basic of gamification design. We are thinking as game designers in the, in the design process. And to do this, I need to create goals for the, my player. Part of the whole idea of creating gamification is that I create challenges and I create goals. And it's not my main goals, the ones that will move my motivation. It's actually the secondary goals I create for my player, those that are voluntary. If you if you ever play video games uh, and, and sorry? Sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. I think it was feedback. So if you ever play video games, in video games, there's more that you can do that you don't need than the things you need to do. Think of Mario Bros. Right? So I hope most of you have played Mario Brothers. I, it's, it's, really, it's really unlikely that, 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 that you haven't, but if you haven't, go play Mario Brothers just for the cultural <laughs> idea of how this works. But if you play Mario Brothers, how are the goals in Mario Brothers built into the system? First, you have narrative goals. Narr narration phrase creates anchoring. Anchoring is the idea that if I know that I have this plumber that has to save this princess, it's easier for me to create purpose, artificial purpose, but it's still purpose. It creates epic identity. So if I play Mario Brothers, it's easier for me to understand the game if I have this clear narration where I have a bad guy that kidnaps this princess and now I have to rescue her. Of course, narrations need to account for cultural biases. For example, this kind of narration of the princess being rescued 
that worked really well in the 80s and before that. It was part of the whole chivalry thing. Doesn't work in the 21st century. We have seen that people are moving more towards empowered women, like House of Cards or something like that. We like more women that are really empowered in our, in our media. So having the princess being rescued by the plumber, that won't work. Now, new Mario Brothers games, you play with Peach, and sometimes you can even try to save the plumber. And that's uh, that, that, that kind of inversion means that you're understanding the culture where you're creating the, creating the narration, and that creates anchoring. Then you have main goals. Main goals in Mario Brothers are, I need to get to the, to the pole at the end of the level. I need to finish every level. I need to play the castle level and finish it. I need to advance from level to level. Those are the things that you need to do to actually make the game advance. That's a main goal. It's not voluntary. It's mandatory if you want to advance the game. But your reward is just being enabled to move along in the game forward. That's the only thing you do. You don't have, you can create rewards around that, but it's not necessary. If you played Mario Brothers and you get to the end of the level, you didn't win anything at all. You just won the access to the next level. You were able to play a harder level, a different level, right? So cu curiosity moves you along around those mandatory um, mandatory goals. But from there on, everything you do in Mario is optional, it's optative. So you can get the power-ups or maybe don't. You can try to find the, everything in the pipes or maybe don't. You can, and you can go in, through the whole BEM spectrum of drivers and find a goal for each driver. So in terms of epic identity, is you are the hero saving the princess. In terms of empowerment, you can have power-ups that make you powerful and you can kill enemies with those power-ups. Right, so that gives you control over time. You can have this little star that makes you invulnerable. That's that creates feeling of power. Right, from discovery, you have all these hidden boxes, all these pipes that sometimes work and sometimes don't, and sometimes it, 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 they can lead you to great places, but sometimes they just don't do anything. And you have to try in everywhere and, ex and do experimentation to try to find all the secrets in the game. That moves a lot the discovery process. Then you have mastery. Mastery, for example, you can try to uh, speed run uh, the game. You can try to uh, lose as little um, lose as little lives as possible. Try to play the game perfectly, in a sense. And you can manage those abilities by trying the game again and again and again. Right? Relatedness in Mario Brothers can come from playing with other people from feeling related with the plumber. It doesn't have a lot of relatedness. You don't relate really well with Peach, in, especially in the classic Mario Brothers. That's a driver that's really flimsy in Mario Brothers. But if you played with someone in your couch, it could be a way of creating relation with people through, game, through, through the game. So there could be something there, right? Hedonism, is about, it's built around this, the aesthetic of the game, this surrealism that brings this game to life, that you have these mushrooms that make you big and these weird creatures, these turtles with wings, and that creates a sort of attraction, especially when the, in the time of the retro games, the, those were amazing graphics. Right now, we have other kind, uh, we have a different bar, but this is still brings some nostalgic principles. There are a lot of retro-like games right now because of that, because of that hedonistic principle, right? And there are goals in terms of hedonism, trying to see all the backgrounds of the different uh, Mario Brothers levels. That's built around hedonism. And efficiency, you can create efficiency by understanding how to manage the coins, the time, again, speedruns manage around in terms of efficiency, don't lose lives, managing resources. Mario Brothers is not big on managing resources, not the classic at least, the classic one at least. There are others where you have um, hammers that you can use and they will go away and that kind of things, but they're working around the idea of efficiency. And if you see what game designers do is they try to create a lot of optional things to do that can push different types of players. And these things are optional because if I make them mandatory, people will create resistance to them. If you don't like to discover, and I say you need to find every hidden place in the game, or you want to win the game, you will hate me, right? So I need to create these challenges in a way that they're enticing to you. 
through rewards or through discovery, or there are a lot of ways. Secondary missions tend to have a lot of rewards, so people will be uh, enticed, attracted to try the challenge. But again, the challenge, the engagement of the challenge re requires that I feel like I'm meeting a uh, real, um, the satisfying a real driver. That's that's the point around this. So this is a way of a start. I start building goals around these drivers to go and design my system. But here comes the interesting part around this, this, this idea of designing the system through this, um, through satisfying these different drivers. And that is, the tip is to change the player, you need to change the game, right? You need to change the game. That's the idea behind the gamification. We create rules. We create rules that supersede rules in the real life. In gamification, I want you to use these rules to try to uh, take different decisions in real life. But I need to create those rules because people will not create those, those rules for themselves. People are not great designing for themselves. We don't create goals for ourselves. If I tell you what, what is your goal uh, for, I don't know, 20 years in the future, that's a hard question. Many people have think about that, but a lot of people haven't and they feel uncomfortable thinking, what will I do 20 years from now? We hate that. We prefer to have our goals designed for us. That's why we play games, because games don't, we don't have to create the goals on the rules. Someone else did it for us. So it's better. If you have to invent a game from the scratch, if you're with your friends and you say, let's play a game, we don't have anything. Let's invent something. Oh, no. <laughs> let's try to find something that already was invented. And that's part of the principle behind the gamification. We can design these transformation environments. And if we are um, great at, uh, at doing our jobs, people will change in a le with less resistance than with, uh, with other methods, methods if we understand the, these principles in a clear way. So, um, that is, I think, because of the time. Okay. <laughs> I have two choices. I can make you do this challenge, or we can go on to the next part that's about learning loops, feedback loops, and these kind of things. Uh, because of the time, I don't think I will be able to do the, both of them. So I will leave the choice to you. So type number one, if you want to do the challenge and try to try to create something from this, or type number two, if you prefer more no and more knowledge-based uh, play shop. So two, knowledge-based. knowledge, knowledge based. Okay, it was kind of predictable. In the other, in, in the first one, you would have to think and we like our efficiency. So let's go for the efficient method. So, so the efficiency driver one and the, and the idea of getting more information. So let's skip this and let's go to the, uh, the information. So what's, what's the idea behind this? We need to understand that there are human systems, right? We have natural systems, we have the physics of the world and we have the loss of the world as it is and that we can't change. But around that as humans, we have created an artificial world that has created a lot of rules. We have created rules for everything we can imagine. But the problem is that the rules of the real world are too complex. They're chaotic and they're inconsistent, right? So they become overwhelming. There's a lot of conflicted information. So if I want to teach leadership to a company, there are 17 models of leadership. So which one is it? It's really hard to actually make choices in the real world because there's a lot of information and there's little feedback around that information. It's hard to actually get feedback on if I did the right choice or not. So when I went to Times Square my first time, there was a lot to do and I had to choose which I would see and which I wouldn't. And when I came back, I met people that went to Times Square and they asked me about a lot of things that I didn't see. I just didn't see and I felt like, okay, my, my, my choices were not great. I don't know, I, I try to make choices for myself and I don't feel that, that they improved my experience. And that's because our world, our human system, I, I, the way I say this, uh, the human system, the human world is a really bad designed game. It's a crappy game, it's crappy game design. 
we are patching all our rules and we don't understand why. So for example, you have 100 people in your company and they're all happy. And you have this autonomous system where people can do everything they want and they can come and go and everything. And one person takes advantage of that system and says, if I can do everything I want, I will not do anything. I will just play PlayStation and yeah, I will lie when, I, when they ask me for my reports and I will invent them, invent everything I say. And this person will create a cognitive dissonance in my rule set. I will say, okay, there are people that are bad and I need to stop this. And what happens? I start creating rules. So I start saying, okay, if you're not working, if I see you playing PlayStation during work hours, then consequences, consequences. That's a patch. In game design terms, that's called a patch. I'm patching the rule. I'm creating a little parchment to fix the problem, right? But the problem is that that patch actually doesn't work as we intended. Because now, all those other people that were autonomous and were working and were happy working, now they feel that, like, like they're being restricted for something they didn't do wrong. And that's a big problem. We start creating things that kill the enjoyment for many people just to avoid the bad behaviors of a few, right? And we start creating a lot of rule sets trying to uh, stop all bad behavior and that starts creating a big bureaucracy around what we're doing. And we start feeling that we need that bureaucracy, that we need all those rules and we need to enforce those rules and we create these deep, heavy scenarios where we have a lot of rules and we don't know how to move around those rules. So this hinders our ability to learn and be motivated. That's the problem. It's a crappy game design. We are playing a game that's not designed to improve our experience, but to improve the need of the designer of the rules. And that's problematic. That's why we have this political crisis where congressmen and crown congresswomen uh, tend to create bills that benefit them in some way, even if that creates a, a big gap in inequality or something like that. And it happens because people create rules for their own advantage. Something that I found in playtesting when I play test my games is that I have to be really careful because when I show the, play, the game to players, players will try to modify the rules. They will give me advice on the rules in a way that it will benefit them as players. And I have to be aware that I need to keep a balance among all the players. Then I, ca I cannot give everything to a certain player because that will hinder the enjoyment of other players. And I need to balance all these, all these things, right? So imagine a game designer building a World of Warcraft or Minecraft and, or Fortnite, heavy multiplayer games where there are a lot of social interactions and I need to create a model of the world where players will enjoy themselves. And this is hard. This is hard to pull. This is not easy to pull, right? But the main thing here is that game systems are structured, coherent, have predictable rules, but have unpredictable outcomes. That last one is really important for learning and change. I cannot change if I can predict. That's, that's one of the problems around this whole idea of changing people is if they find that they can confirm all their, their biases, well, I don't have to change. They only change if they feel uncomfortable, un uncomfortable in a way, right? So that is created by um, creating unpredictable outcomes, bro, right? So part of the thing is that uh, that even the rules, if, if, if the rules change in a system, that change in the rules is actually ruled by the system itself. There's a game that's called Flux. I will put it in the chat. It's a party game, a uh, card game. And the idea behind the game is that all the time the rules are changing because each time you play a card, the card creates new rules for the game. So you never know which player will actually win. But even though it has, it's a really chaotic game, it has a core basic of rules that never change. The rules are that if you play a rule changing card, the rules will change in a way. So you have predictable rules even in a game like that. So the model is simplified for you. If you understand it, it's more easy to understand the consequences of your actions if you have proper feedback elements that help you understand the system. And this brings us to the first concept here of designing your system around understanding the cognition of your players. 
And the first concept will be designing for complexity. Designing for complexity, if you see these three screens, the three screens are from the same game. But if, you, if I ask you to try to analyze them, you can feel there's just too much information going down here. You don't know, you wouldn't know where to start. And that's complexity. Complexity means that I have to process a lot of information and a lot of rule sets to actually create an outcome, right? So you cannot analyze this because you don't have the, if you haven't played the game, you don't have the understanding of the game, the understanding of the interface, you don't have the understanding of the informational process. So it's really hard for you to actually analyze these games. And I have placed three different screenshots with different information. So it creates a cognitive barrier, but I can break this down. I can say, okay, let's just work with one first. Right? And through this first one, we will talk about information chunking. This is one of the, of the really important game design paradigms that you need to understand. Information chunking. When we talk about change, we try to speed the changing process. We want, I have had to work with a lot of really quickly. Yeah, but mm -hmm. if you, go too fast, you will meet more resistance, right? Like in that previous slide, you, if I go too fast, I will be, be met with resistance. So I need to pace the things in the most optimal way. That's how I create meaningful change. Too fast, you will create resistance, you won't learn. Too slowly, and you will feel this efficiency pain. So what games do is they create information chunking. Information chunking is the idea that when I start the game, I don't need all the information in the interface mm -hmm. to play the game as if I was an expert. I just need the basic information. I give you simple goals. Mm -hmm. I give you simple processes so you can understand how to play the game, how to move along in that world. It's new for you. So you need to lower the complexity level to a minimum and give the interface elements their proper explanation. I need to know that here in the corner, I will see the my health bar and my magic bar. And I need to understand that each time I press a magic button and I do a fireball, my magic bar will go down. I need to understand those rule sets, but I need the main rule sets to be able to move along that world. And when we do change, sometimes we try to give all the information at once. I have done, for example, a consultancy for, for, for an agile company. That's why I'm quoting them. That I, I have this, uh, that's called a availability, avail, availability heuristic. That is, we try to uh, make our examples from the things that we remember the most. And I worked with them recently. And the idea was they, in a three-day workshop, they were trying to place all the information people needed to actually become AI. Agile. And so what happened with them that the, their clients were really overwhelmed with all these corn boards and all the information and all everything that they had to do and all these new rules and the people just wouldn't be able to do that. And that created resistance. So one of the things I told them is chunk it down. Don't go that fast. You're going slowly because you're rushing the process. So information chunking is one way to go. But then I need to understand that there is also mechanical chunking. Mechanical I didn't understand a thing. Let's play. Let's play. And by playing, they start understanding the things while they're using the things and they're understanding how they move in the game and not just not from my explanation. So I have figured that each time I play a game, a board game with a new player, I start doing mechanical chunking. I say in the first round, we will play only with these rules. And in the second round, I will give you an additional rule that you will need, but I won't explain all the rules to you. That's called a tutorial. That's a tutorial in game design. And that's the scaffolding process in game design. I give you the rule sets one by one. When you are familiar when, with one, when you feel mastery with one, when you have discovered everything you want to discover from that one, then I release another one. And this is great because it also helps to create this discovery, move, uh, discovery paradigm where I'm learning new things all the time. So I, I feel like I'm receiving new content in a way. So that's better than just having the whole panorama of rules I need to teach. 
So there's the mechanical chunking. I know new skills. I have no new abilities. Now this player has all these abilities in the bottom that in the, in the first example, you could see that it only had one or two. Now it has a lot of abilities and he, the player knows how to use them because they have acquired them one by one. Each level up has given them one more ability to master. And that's easier because the last ability, it's already in the, my long-term memory and I know how to use it. And then there's attentional filtering. If I have this kind of interface, this is a master player interface and you can see, you, you might be thinking, oh my God, right? I hope you are thinking, oh my God, this is how can someone understand this quantity of information? How can that happen? And the truth is players don't, aren't re reading all that information at the same time. They have all the information, but they don't use all the information at the same time. They know when to look where. That's attentional filtering. When you have a really complex system, you need to teach your players when certain information is valuable and when it is not. Actually, a, a lot of games, for example, if you have to attack with a certain different uh, special attack uh, an enemy, they will create an icon that will flash in the screen. That is to help you make the decision process and reduce the cognitive process in a really complex scenario. When I have complex scenarios, I want to give notifications to my player that will allow them to make quick choices, even though they have a lot of information. And this is something we need to design. This is something that we game designers know that if we don't design, people will start losing their minds trying to play our games. So we need to give, for example, attention and filtering, one of the ways we do that, if you play video games more than board games, and in board games you do attentional filtering as well, but in video games, they, in, in digital interfaces, one of the things you can do, this is called feedback rules, is that, for example, if you, if you really need to know you, how is your health bar right now, I will make it flash, I will make it move, I will, is a sound that will help you understand that something's happening with your health bar. That's called discriminatory sounds. Sounds that help you understand where to look. That's great. Uh, sound design is amazing in game design to make you look, right? So if you hear, if you are in a casino and you hear tin, 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 you know someone wants something and just start looking for that. That's called attentional seeking. Attentional seeking is I want to find the source of that information. And as game designers, we use that a lot to reduce the cognitive uh, overflow of having too much information. And we need to do it if we want really masterful players. They, masterful players are people that can have all this information and know exactly when to see what. It's absolutely amazing what the brain can accomplish. And I have a problem when I work with gamification with some clients. When I explain the rule sets that I want to implement to a client, they say, this seems too hard. This is too complex. Right, and it's a 20 page long uh, game manual and it, it's too complex. I have played board games with more than 20 pages of rules, but if you know the rule sets of a game like World of Warcraft, it would be in the hundreds of pages. It's not, it, when you read the rules, you feel it's, they're really complex. When you play with the rules, you know that the brain can actually manage a lot of complexity and it's amazing what the brain can do. And that's a fear I must take away from my clients all the time. This is not complex. If we chunk it down, want to create, just don't give them all at the same time, right? That's like learning Microsoft Word for the first time. It's horrible, you get this, screen with a lot of commands and you don't know where to start. You don't have this informational chunking. You have a lot of uh, menus and things that you, it, they're just overwhelming. And it happens if you could use the Adobe Suite, for example, all these programs, they don't have a clear learning process. So the way people learn to use those software is by watching videos that chunk the information for them. So how can I do a color filtering? So let's see the video, five minutes video. Okay, these tools. And I learn only those tools and I forget, I filter all the other information out. It's the only way to manage that kind of complexity. But people can learn that kind of complexity and by design we can create it. And that can create change in the long term because we are actually 
wiring the brain to understand information in a different way. The rules and information in this chunking process, our brain will start adapting to those rules and understand how to move them along the game. When I failed, why I failed, how I can improve, all this process. So that's designing for complexity. That's one of the main things that you have to do as a gamification designer. The next thing is designing for mastery. Uh, of course, there's designing for discovery, designing for empowerment, designing for all of these drivers. I could have a slide of designing for, but I will focus only on uh, designing for mastery and complexity. Complexity has a lot of to do with discovery. Um, but I want to focus a lot in mastery because most of meaningful, the meaningful change, changes we do in our lives tend to revolve around feeling empowerment by mastery, feeling that we are competent enough to try them and being able to understand the consequences of doing the right or wrong actions. And that helps us move along in the transformation process. It's really important. That's why learning is so focused on mastery, for example, even though it should focus on other drivers, learning in terms of the schools, universities, it's all focused on mastery. So how do games design for mastery? They design for mastery using a con two concepts that I will explain a little bit better right now uh, in, the, in the next slides that are negative and positive feedback loops. And I will give you just a small idea of what that is so you can understand what you're seeing here. This is, this is from a theory that's called the flow theory from uh, Mihaly Chitsen Mihaly. This is one of these theories that everyone that's trying to work around games, gamification, change should know because it's a really important theory to understand how people engage intrinsically to different things. And in this theory, uh, uh, Chitsen Mihaly was asking the question of why so, uh, some people enter this flow state where they forget about time, about space, about everything, and they're just focused, amazingly focused, and learning a lot, and it's, it's an amazing state. And what he found out is that it depended on a relationship between difficulty and ability, perceived difficulty and perceived ability, actually. And the idea behind this is if the difficulty was too high if it crossed what, what it what it call what he calls the frustration threshold he calls it anxiety actually i call it frustration because as a game designer i tend to think more about frustration in games than anxiety in games but it's 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 related but the frustration threshold is when things are so hard that you start feeling anxious and feeling incompetent that you can't do what you're being asked to do it's just over your Proximal capabilities. Proximal capabilities, my, that's there again, this concept of scaffolding is a concept that tells you that you have an a, a proximal zones of development where you can feel comfortable, even if you don't know things, you feel like you can learn them. Like again, a, a pianist that is uh, learning a new song and it's just harder than his current skills, but he knows that if he practices enough, he can get there. That's that proximal zone. And if you are not in that, you don't feel it's in that proximal zone. It's too hard, it's just too hard to become frustrated. And we don't want to cross that line. Frustration makes people leave your game or your system or your changing change process or your learning process, everything. People will just feel frustrated. But we have a boredom threshold. The boredom threshold is when the difficulty is so low that you feel that you don't have any chance to lose most of our mechanical endeavors, the things that we do mechanically, are things that don't motivate us because we just know that we can do them, that there is no uncertainty. So they become boring. They're not as stimulating. So if you have to do a repetitive task one and again, over and over, your brain starts daydreaming because you want to feel stimulated. Your brain starts creating distractions. And that's why uh, workers in factories tend to have such so many accidents because they're working in a repetitive process and their brain starts trying mm -hmm. to stimulate them by creating distractions daydreaming and that's really problematic and that's because of the boredom threshold so a game can't be too difficult but can't be too easy because both of them will disengage your players but when you are in between these lines that's called the flow channel and the flow channel 
um, actually people just play, it's like a wavy wine, uh, line saying you need to increase the challenge, reduce the challenge, increase the challenge, reduce the challenge. That's like a simplified version of this, of this theory. In, in the BEM framework, we try to make this a little bit more complex understanding that we find four types of, uh, of like emotions in play when you play around the flow, the, this flow channel. You have relaxation, that's when you can pass the game without much effort. You can just, it's, it, it is challenging enough to keep you focused, but you don't feel like you're going to lose. And these moments of relaxation, they're not a lot. There are a few moments of relaxation, but the games use them to give you, um, to reduce your cognitive overload of, uh, of having to do harder things. So you have these moments where you just, Click buttons and everything in the screen just dies. It's easy, ah, right? It's, it feels empowering in a way. Mm. Then you have confidence. Confidence is the skill level you need. You need to be more focused because you know you can do it. You know it's possible to fail, mm. but you have a high chance of making it. So mm. most of the game, they try to keep you in that confidence level where you feel like you can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I am I'm confident. I, I can solve this problem. Um, and it still is not that difficult. And this is a place where most players are. So it, I, they, I think you talked about Counter-Strike. Uh, some of you play, played Counter-Strike. So in these shooter games, you have these really hard scenarios, but after you go away from those hard scenarios, you have these big hallways or big moments of the game where you're just shooting things. Uh, there's a little bit of danger, but you don't feel really the danger. You, you, again, this, is, this creates a sense of empowerment. But then there's tension and the boss level. Tension is, okay, I start feeling that I can lose. I need to be really focused because now I can lose. Not totally but I can lose. It's not that really hard. You, don't, you, you, can't, you, you know that there's a high chance of doing it, but you feel like you can ac accomplish it. But when you get to the boss level, there, in that moment, the game designers move mm. you to a more master-oriented game where you probably, probably will lose. And you know, as a player, you probably will lose. Like when you get to the boss level. You get to the boss level and you don't expect to get that right in the first try. And you start playing and you feel it's sometimes infuriating. It, it, it can be, you get near that frustration threshold. And you can see here players saying, oh my God, this is so hard. And why do we create these scenarios? Why do we create these small boss levels? Because those boss levels can create a heavy emotion that Nicola Tsaro, which is a, uh, an academic of, uh, someone that studies games a lot, uh, called Fiero. And fiero is the emotion that you get from um, getting to do something that you thought was nearly undoable. And that creates a sense of accomplishment that like no other. You see the faces of the players in wow, and the relaxation and all the adrenaline just flows and it's, oh my God. And actually after a boss level, you usually take your players to a relaxation state because they need to, liberate all that dopamine and all that adrenaline and all that cocktail of hormones that you have just released. And mm. that is a, an amazing feeling, but you need to create these moments in, you need to create a spacing. So actually, when you design for mastery, you try to take players from confidence to tension, from tension again to confidence, again, a little bit, hard, a little bit harder confidence, but then again, you lower it down and then you create high tension. And before the boss level, you go to relaxation and then you create this climatic moment where everything just blows and it's awful and there's a lot of information. You, has, you have to use all your skill sets. And negative feedback loops are about creating barriers, about making mm. the, the, the process of passing the game more difficult. And this is really important for game design. We want people to feel like, like that they're moving along in a diagonal way in this flow channel, that they're improving their skills. And the only way to do that is by creating negative feedback loops that increase difficulty over time. But I also need to use positive feedback loops to create moments of sensation of mastery and accomplishment. I need to be able to feel like I can do this. So imagine the sensation of being the player playing what you see 
in that screen. That's a Mario Bros. modification. That's not from the actual game, of course, but it's it looks so amazingly hard that imagine what would feel if you could actually accomplish it. That would be Fiero. Oh, question from Mia, amazing. From your experience research benchmarks, how many hours of gaming on daily basis consider addicting? Okay, so addiction, uh, uh, to, to answer that question, that's an amazing question. Um, you need to consider that not everything is addiction. Uh, there's addiction and compulsion. Most players find their se themselves first in a compulsory state than in an addictive state. Addiction creates withdrawal effects. Withdrawal effects is if I don't play, I become anxious, I can do anything if I don't play, and that's, that's horrible. It's your brain tells you if you don't do this activity, I will make you suffer in a sense, right? Like cigarettes, like withdrawing from the, from cigarettes or withdrawing from love. A, break, a breakup is a withdrawal effect because love is addictive, especially in the early stages, the dopaminergic stages of love, they're really addictive. So if your significant other leaves you, the withdrawal is horrible, right? So that's, that's addictive. Uh, that's addictive behavior. Compulsory behavior is just around the corner. It doesn't have the withdrawal effects. You can leave the game and you can feel, you can play, manage your life in a almost normal state, but you want to play the game so bad that you start losing the scope of the other important things that you have in your life. And compulsory activities make you feel like you're not in control of yourself, like your brain is controlling you in a sense. And that creates a sense of disempowerment. So most games that actually start Get, um, becoming troublesome are when you start getting into the compulsory behavior stage, not the addiction stage. So around addiction, there's a lot of marketing in games around this game is really addictive, play it now. That's really weird, right? Why are we marketing addiction in that way? And games do that. It's, it's so awful, but uh, people actually like feeling addictive to games. I don't, I, that's, that's a weird thing, but we don't want that. So when do compulsory behaviors start? Uh, this is probabilistic. It changes from person, for, for, from person to person, but uh, research has shown that when a person plays more than two hours daily, right? Especially video games and especially uh, inten intense video games, right? So if they start playing more than two hours daily in a daily basis, they, the probabilities of generating compulsory behaviors start going up. Before two, uh, two hours, um, the probabilities are low. But after two hours, they start to increment as, and if you increment more the hours of play, uh, the chances start incrementing as well. There are players that can play six hours a day and never have a compulsory behavior. They can manage really well in their lives. But there are players that they play two hours a day and they start mm -hmm creating these compulsory behaviors. So the thing to know around these kind of processes, and I know I told you I like to be thrown out of my topic. Um, the thing to know is that you need to flag some behaviors if, uh, and some thought processes. Uh, those thought processes that you have to flag is, for example, if the player starts saying that they feel more rewarded in the game than in real life, that in the, in the game people understand me and in real life people don't. That kind of things are, um, flags that you can find that mean that the person is starting to create um, the wrong kind of thoughts about the game. So that's that would be uh, like the short answer for a really, really hard question. But yeah, in, in terms of gamification, I try to dose off gamification designs as much as I can to avoid addiction. And I don't create rewarding cycles, but feedback cycles to create meaningful uh, action around my gamification process. And I always, always try to avoid addiction. That's something that I try to avoid because people, when they feel addicted or in compulsion, they feel manipulated again. And that creates resistance to change in a way. So we don't want to get there. We don't want to get there. That would be my answer. Hope it answers your question, yeah. Um, so again, so we're designing for mastery. And when we are designing for mastery, we need to, to understand how we learn from this. Because one of the things that create addiction and compulsion to games is actually the high learning content 
that you feel like you're learning a lot of things in the game, that you're constantly feeling competent in the game. And that depends on a game learning mm -hmm. loop. And these game loops, loops, I can actually apply them to anything in, in, in life. And I can do that. As a game designer, I can think of almost every learning process and uh, as, a, as a learning loop. And the, 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 like the diameter of the loop tells a lot about how we learn. So let's start by this. So again, we're going to enter play mode again. So again, there do we have two options here. Uh, we're getting to the end of the, of the workshop. So let's play a little bit. I have, you have been hearing a lot from me and you haven't been interacting. So let's do this again. So uh, look at this chessboard, right? So when you see this chessboard, even if you don't know how to play the chess, the chess, just try to speculate. No problem there. So again, same rules. Everyone will click enter when I say go at the count of three. And I want to know, what do you think about this board? Do you think that one white have the advantage because of the alignment of the rook and queen? This alignment that I'm showing you here with my mouse, this creates an advantage for whites. Or do you think that black have the advantage the black player has the advantage because of the queen, queen, king alignment. This alignment here, where if I move this queen, I cannot move this queen because the black queen would capture my king. So even if you don't know anything about chess and you see these pieces and you see this information, what do you think is happening here? Just make a speculation. So write the number and I will start counting. One, two, three. Go. Ah, it depends on whose move it is, Varun. Amazing. <laughs> that was not part of the rules, Varun. You had to place one or two, but again, it's uh, actually appropriate. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I'm not going to give you a right answer, right? But I'm going to give you something that's more important for you. It's understanding that the cognitive process you just went by is called the analysis of the game status. And it's in a cognitive way, it's pattern inference. Pattern inference, what you're doing is when you try to make a choice in life, you take the information that you have available and you process that, uh, that information through your heuristics and biases, all those things, based on previous experiences. And previous experiences are really important for learning, of course, right? But you try to understand what's happening in this game by trying to find patterns. And the thing is a masterful player can see more patterns than a new player, than a new player. A new player just don't see the patterns. They, can't, they don't understand that there are some hidden patterns that are really dangerous there, right? So I gave you two patterns and I make you choose between two patterns, but there's a lot to infer from this board. You can make a lot of inference. If you play a lot, you make different inferences. For example, who, who, whose move is it? That's something that you can't infer. That's a valid question because it's nothing, you cannot find that on the board, mm. but you can find other information on the board, right? Like the position of the pawns, that there's a knight that's been, uh, that, that is being threatened by a bishop here, mm. right? The positions of the kings and how the kings are protected. All that information, you can start trying to create patterns and better patterns, which will help mm -hmm. you create more strategic models. So the first thing in the learning process is in a game, system, what I want is to create not rewarding systems, but informational systems that allow people to create choices. And from those choices, they can understand harder patterns along the way. They can start inferring more information from the same game status. That's what you do when you play. And that's why it's so important to chunk information, because you need to be able to learn to manage more information over time. And then it comes the call to action. So here's your answer, Baron. Quite uh, it's White's turn, right? So when I say it's White's it's White's turn, I'm making a call to action. It's what I'm doing here in this more interactive part. When I say press one or two, one, two, three, go, I'm making a call to action because without a call to action, is the probabilities of behavior are less. Now those probabilities of behavior depend on a lot of factors. Just placing a one or two on a keyboard is less demanding. And it feels, it, you, you don't feel like, you don't worry as much about losing 
uh, than if I told you, please uh, turn on your microphone and tell me what you see here. If I do that, the shame, the social shame and all these avoidance drivers create this process where people don't just want to share. They, 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 oh, okay, I, don't, I just don't want to say anything. And it, it brings these awkward moments. So the, 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 this design that I created around just giving you these choices and pressing enter is actually to allow interactivity between you and me without having all these awkward silences, right? Of course, discussion questions that creates a lot of engagement. We love to discuss and engage this way, but we in a group of people that we don't know, it's really tends to be really shameful. So we prefer not to do that that much. So you need a call to action. So turn on your microphone, that's a call to action, but the probability of the behavior is really low because there's no consequence in not doing that, right? So here, we have a call to action, and then we have the third part of the learning loop. The third part of the learning loop is what you see here in the screen, right? So it's white storm. So what are the options for white? I will give you three, and you will tell me what, which one would you like to do? So you can take the queen and black, I think if I take this queen, black will take my queen in response. That, that's the first model. The second model is I will take the rook, right? But black will escape with, its, with his king to this uh, white uh, square here in the board, right? So that would, he will escape, but maybe that's what I want right now. Or the third move is I can take the knight, right? The black knight, but black will take my queen. So which of these three scenarios would you prefer? Again, if you were playing a real match of chess, you don't have this cognitive help. You, will, you would have to think about every pawn and every move of every piece. But here I'm reducing the cognitive, uh, the, the cognitive overload so you can think a little bit more about specific moves. You don't have to analyze the whole game. Right. So if you think that this will take you a lot of time, like Varun says, it's because you know more about the game and you're more motivated to analyze more information about the game because you're a chess player. If you're not a chess player, you will try to reduce your cognitive overload by trying to make the most intuitive decision. And intuition usually is wrong. That's part of the interesting part of understanding these psychological processes. If I make you take the wrong move, that can be great in terms of learning. So I gave you a lot of time, now it's time to count. So one, two, three, go. Okay, three, two, three. Other people are still thinking. <laughs> okay, so when you answer really quickly a question, it's because you have an answer already in your long-term memory. That's called the system one in psychology. It's decision, quick decision making, right? Because uh, if we do this kind of process, we, we, we don't want our lives to be just making the slow decisions. We need to make quick decisions. That's an evol evolutionary um, advantage, actually. But this cognitive process makes a lot of mistakes. So one of the ways that our brain really learns a lot is by doing mistakes and then trying to analyze different approaches and seeing which one works better. By trial and error, we learn a lot. That's how our brain likes to learn. It lowers the cognitive process. But when you are motivated and when you cannot do this kind of process, you have to activate uh, your task positive network, the system two. The first one is the default mode network in your brain. And the second one, the task positive network, which has to concentrate, focus, infer information, bring relationships, create logic statements. And that's hard for our brain. We don't like to do it unless we are highly driven. Otherwise, we will say, ah, no, I don't want to take, make that choice. So John actually says none because moving queen would put you in check. Um, yeah, so I cannot make... Uh, the, 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 I cannot take the rook, but I can take their queen and I can actually take their knight because that won't place me in check, John. But actually the movement of the rook actually is a forbidden rule, that is right. Um, okay, so 
<laughs> oh dear, <laughs> three. <laughs> so see how those that know a little bit more about chess gave different kind of reactions. They, they didn't just play, press the one, they, they give it more thought. And uh, John says, I'm not a chess player, obviously, but you know enough to know that that's a forbidden move. You know more patterns than many others that haven't played chess. So you're not a chess player. Yes, you are a chess player. The question is, what's your proficiency in chess, right? To be a chess player, you just need to know the rules. But what's your proficiency in chess? And that is created by <laughs> bad. <laughs> it's a bad proficiency. <laughs> so this is created by playing the game. You cannot become a highly proficient chess player if you don't play the game several times because you will lose all those patterns. And this is part of the learning loop. It's the process of decision making. That's why I'm just saying everyone to everyone gamification is about decision making. It's not about behavioral economics. It's not about behavioral science. It's not, not about reducing the spectrum of error. Because if I want to change people, I need to allow them to make choices. Because if there is no choice, there are no failure states. So there is no chance to improve and change, right? So this requires a prediction model. The prediction model is in, in chess is try to figure out what will happen next. That's why I ask you if, you, if I move the queen, he will move the rook. It's the idea of trying to predict how the system will react to my actions. That's what we are trying to do. That's what our brain tries to do all the time. And when we fail to make that prediction, right? If we fail to make that prediction, something happens, something magical happens, right? So let's say that uh, White decided to take the black queen and black responded, not by taking the queen as we thought, but by taking our rook, right? Because, because now I'm in check and if I move my king, then black player can take my queen. I have to move my king. So that's a difficult pattern. That's not an easy pattern. If you're not a chess player, this is a pattern that is not obvious in chess, right? So I thought it would be a clean change of queens and no. The black, black decided to take my rook and place me in check, right? So understanding that this is what happened, what can you say about this move? Number one, that it was a good move because white can escape and, es and threaten the rook. I move my king here and then I can attack black's rook in the future. So white is still safe. Or two, it was a bad move because black can still take my queen and he took my rook, so still I'm in trouble. So what do you think? Number one or number two? So one, two, three, go. It was a good move moving the, taking the queen or not? Okay, good move, good move, not a good move, right? So uh, I, I would expect in this kind of systems to find variance in your reactions, that some of you would understand this as a good move, some of you would understand it as a bad move. And I used chess as an example because I know there are not a lot of chess players. That's the idea. Why? Because, oh, do I was asking about Black's move. No, about the White's move. We are White players. And because the learning loop depends on the perspective of the player. So when I when I ask if it was a good move, it's moving my queen was a good move, right? So you will find variance because the understandment isn't as easy as what we think happens in an education. That's just a correction process. So bad move, good move. That's just con the operant conditioning. I, I, it's not about that. A learning process is more complex in a cognitive sense. We try to evaluate uh, our moves in regards to the response of the system, but that evaluation requires also repetition to be able to better analyze the responses. What did I see? Did I, what did I didn't? What I didn't see? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for my shameful English. So that, that's kind of the that's the kind of thing that we're working here with is the learning loop allows me to make decisions and then check for those decisions. Check my prediction model. So here my prediction model didn't work because I thought uh, they would take me my queen. So this creates a sense of response and revaluation. 
This is what feedback means. Feedback is not just saying great, but great, but eh. mm -hmm. that's not feedback. It's not just pressing a, a button and saying point and uh, Mario jumping. That's not the only way of understanding feedback. It's understanding that feedback comes comes from the from the theories of interaction of interactivity and interactivity requires response. And our brains mm -hmm. are great at understanding response process. That we need responses to actually modify our hypothesis. Hypothesis. That's why we interact a lot with arguments. We are stubborn in some ways. If you try to uh, convince people by just giving arguments, that won't happen really well. You need another kind of feedback. Arguments are hypotheses themselves. So you are reluctant to, to believe in other people's arguments because you always think that they don't have the whole picture uh, as well. So how can they be right? why they would be right. So you need more than arguments to actually move people forward. You need to, to see actually the results of doing certain things in the real world. That's how our brains try to learn better. And that's really important for change. So it's important to know that our brain will not learn just from a few mistakes or a few successes, that our brain is a stubborn, right? So I, uh, our time is almost up. I have this great video for you. I will put the, just find, search for reverse bicycle in Google, reverse bicycle. And it's from a channel that's called in YouTube as, as Smarter Every Day. I wish you can see that video. That's really revealing in terms of the patterns of change in our brain. Basically, the, the idea behind this is um, that the, the, in, the, in the video, this person is trying to learn to move a bicycle that when you move it, the, 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 hand, the handle, you move it to the left, the bicycle goes to the right and vice versa. And it actually takes him several months to actually learn how to move this, this bicycle. And it's really interesting. Thank you, Varun. And it's really interesting to watch. Please watch this video. If you want to understand the process of change, you need to understand that this reinforcement loop is not just about learning, it's also about unlearning. And unlearning is harder than learning. Change creates a reaction because our brain is hardwired to do things in a way that it's, it has a habit. By repetition, it has a habit. So when we want to change behaviors, that habit will start kicking off even if we don't want to. So we will make the same mistakes several times, several times, until my brain is able to rewire itself for the change. So you cannot change this process just by giving rewards. I cannot say to this person, okay, if you manage to do uh, three uh, meters or miles, I don't know your, um, where you're from, but if you manage to do three meters, I will give you a cookie. I don't know, I will give you a status. I will give you stuff, I will give you. No, it requires more more than that, really a lot more. You need a feedback process where when you try, you understand, okay, I couldn't because this unbalanced me in a way and I start doing it again and again and again until I find that balance and I can bring it into a more lower cognitive level in, through using my long-term memory. But my working memory is really bad at doing these processes, these conscious processes. So change, if you see what we- Hey, it's me, Destin. Hey, it's me, Destin. What, what we try to do um, is creating reinforcement and our time is up. So just to build around these ideas uh, is try to build reinforcement around these feedback loops. Uh, I will skip all this and we'll just tell you all the game. Sorry, I told you it was like five hours of presentation, but the gold reinforcement loop becomes really important for change because what I do when I design the gamification process mm -hmm. is think about this a lot, a lot. So I understand that if I have a goal or game objective, the outcome of trying that goal or game objective can be a success, a failure, or a, a state where I don't know. When I don't know, that's, that's the hardest state. But let's go for uh, the, to the, the, the two basic states, success and failure. So what happens here? When I, have, when, when I su succeed, I need to have a feedback negative loop, uh, negative feedback loop and a positive feedback loop that the negative feedback loop will give me an increase of challenge. If I succeed, I reward my player by penalizing him. It's really weird, but I 
create more challenging scenarios. I create more effortful scenarios. So if I'm good, my reward is to be able to be to get better. And that's amazing the way our brain tries to incorporate these kinds of thoughts. But we need to create also a positive feedback loop. Loop. Uh, so we want to pen. Uh, okay, no. Uh, we need to penalize progression um, in a way. Uh, okay, so this 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 is uh, to explain this. It's better to come here because the idea is if I, I want to, I, cre I want to create a positive feedback loop. I need to create things that will make me uh, more successful in the future. So I want to do, for example, give you an item that will allow you to do the task better in the future. Uh, so I think the penalized progression was not what I wanted to go there. Uh, but the idea is that you want in a positive feedback loop to give something that the player feels rewarded. But the idea of a feedback loop is that the consequence of receiving that feedback is that I want to try the game objective again. In the failure state, it happens the same way. I want to increase access if it's a positive. Ah, OK, yeah, I read it wrong. So green is success. So the positive feedback loop is increased access. And the negative feedback loop is increased challenge. I, I forgot my own conventions. Uh, sorry. So the failure, the failure state, the positive feedback loop is that I want to increase certainty. So when I lose, what I want to do is make my player feel like they have more certainty, more information, so the next time I have better odds to actually do the task, like playing a boss level in a video game. I played, I lose. Now I know how it killed me. I have more information. I go again. I lose again. OK, but I want a little bit more of information. This strategy worked. Let's go with that. Let's try that strategy again. Let's go again. I lose again. And I start creating this increased uh, this this increments of certainty that create a positive feedback loop that help me be better in the future, or giving po uh, power ups, for example, that my Mario Kart Mario Kart that happens, but in the negative feedback loop, <laughs> someone just throw in the in the in the slide, in the negative feedback loop scenario in the failure state, I want to penalize progression. So what do I do? Is if you lose, you go back to the beginning of the level. You need to create the stakes. Because if there's not a negative feedback loop, people will feel like failing doesn't require any cognitive cognitive process. It's just about trying trial and error. But if you know that you can be penalized, you will activate more that task a positive network system. So it's about understanding that when I create a loop, giving badges, for example, is not the best way to go. Those are motivational rewards that can increase your enjoyment of the task done. But actually, what you want to do to create change is actually give players the stuff that will allow them to do the same goal or game objective over again. So a quick example, I have a game where I kill enemies. From killing enemies, I win coins. From gaining coins, I gain uh, swords. And by gaining swords, I want to kill more enemies. That's a loop, right? So. I, the, the reward makes me want to do the action again, just with more increased difficulty, but increased access, that, that, that kind of things. But if I fail, what I want to do is give information, give you a tip, give you a, something that will tell you if I have this new information, I should try this goal again. And these loops are the engagement loop, the real engagement loop, right? Not just habit building, it's about increasing the odds of this action happening again in the future. And this is more important than just giving rewards. It's not about rewarding per se. It's about making the player feel like their outcome of, the, of, of trying an objective is something that will allow me to do it better in the future. That's the main thing around gamification. So again, I had a challenge there, but I will not be able to do it. So we are at the end of this of this um, of this talk, right? So um, here is my LinkedIn. If you don't have it, uh, if you have any questions, please contact me. Uh, I hope you understand. This is hard. That gamification is not a magic trick. It's not something that you can just place on your project. If you're thinking on using gamification, you need to give a thoughtful process to the project. And this means understanding the human, 
and the system design. Both of them are really important to actually create behavior change and not uh, and cognitive change, not just behavior change. That's the idea. Not just measuring if people are doing, but what are people feeling and thinking around the things that they are doing? Either feeling manipulated, or they feeling that uh, the designer doesn't have my best interest at heart. That happens, right? Uh, that happens a lot, right? So I need to be able to make you feel like this investment in the gamification system actually improves yourself, makes you feel better with yourself. So that was it. I don't know if you have any questions. I know I have gone over my time, but uh, I know I, I don't know, Varun, if I can take any questions, if you want to say something right now. Yeah, if, if anyone would like to, uh, you know, ask some questions, we can keep we can wait for five minutes. The others can leave for sure. But before the others leave, thank you so much, Javier, because this was just absolutely great. I wish we had more time and, you know, you were able to explain this a little bit uh, uh, slower because, you know, I'm sure there are certain things that we have questions about that we didn't completely comprehend. I know I didn't com comprehend everything completely, but I think this is something that comes from years of practice, right? And years of learning, etc. Uh, right. So any any questions? Uh, and of course, uh, anyone who's uh, who doesn't have questions, free, feel free to leave. But anyone who has questions can stay and, uh, uh, you know, we can we can happily we'd be happy to stay for a few more minutes and answer them. Uh, I just raised my hand, but I don't know. Javier, uh, thank you very much. It was amazing. Uh, just maybe. Um, I know this is a tough question, but if you were to recommend either a book or a course that we could take to go deeper into this, uh, into what you just taught us today, what would you recommend? Okay, so uh, I hate to self-advertise, but I'm uh, building a certification course on this on this whole methodology. I have done it in Spanish before. I'm trying to bring it to English uh around this bm framework that's a way if you want if you want to follow me on linkedin you can be aware of when i'm going to do it again uh but if you don't want to check my stuff i have a lot of articles around gamification in my linkedin account i write i try to write a lot about these things i like to share knowledge but if you want to see other sources uh, there are two things i can um, two tips i can give you in terms of reading about gamification Great reads about gamification are few, right? So there are a lot of things that are consultant books to lure you in into, into so you can contract them. So there are a lot of books that are just for self-promotion, right? So this happens, of course, we are consultants, we have to do this. I, mm -hmm. I do this, I'm doing this workshop also as a self-promotion, right? We need to understand that this happens. But uh, in terms of gamification, I prefer more academic approaches. And I think the best academic approach uh, for to these kind of things, there are two authors that I like, uh, one more than the other. Uh, first one is Scott Nicholson. Scott Nicholson, you can just use Google, Google Scholar, for example. And it's not an easy read, it's a more academic read, but search for Scott Nicholson and he has some great things about uh, gamification. Uh, the other author that's also really academic, but it, he has some TED Talks and some uh, talks that you can see in, in, in YouTube, uh, would be Sebastian Dettering. But from the world of gamification, still is, again, worth noting. Uh, and noteworthy, sorry, <laughs> noteworthy to check the work, uh, for example, the blog uh, from Ander Andrzej Mark Sewski. Uh, he has a great blog. Uh, he has a great blog. He has a couple of books. They're called like, uh, they always have like a ninja, monkey ninjas like to, uh, they have some weird titles, but they're, they're really cool. Uh, he has a really great understanding of, of the topic. Uh, there's Yukai Chu. The thing with Yukai Chu is that maybe it will clash with what I have told you because Yukai Chu, in a sense, has a really heavy behavioral approach to some things. So the mechanics he use are to nudge behavior. And I try to use gamification in a different way. But if you're interested in more behavioral economic approaches, uh, he has a book that's called Actional Gamification, that it's one of these best sellers uh, out there. So that can be great in terms of courses. I haven't seen a course that I really think I can 
honestly say it's great. Of course, there's the, this UPenn course, uh, course of, of Kevin Werbach. I took it. That was my first course in gamification. And it gives some great basis. But for example, I think the whole mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics things thing that he explains are a uh, non-game designer approach to the problem that uh, I'm not really comfortable with. So there are things there that I don't like that much. There, I know that there's like a virtual master's degree uh, given by, uh, I think it's in a Spanish, um, a Spanish um, institution, e e -A -S -B -N. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, therefore it's four letters, so I never, I'm not able to remember their name, uh, but there's a master's course that maybe if you write to me in LinkedIn, I can try to find it for you. Uh, so that's great. But my second tip, the way I approach gamification is by not studying just about gamification. So if you want to read more, for example, around game design, there's a great book that's called The Rules of Play. That's from Eric Zimmerman and Sadi. Uh, that's a great book uh, for learning about human motivation, Edward Desi and Richard Ryan, the whole theory of self-determination. There are a lot of videos around these theories in YouTube as well, if you do prefer a more visual format. Um, there, there, there's that kind of research that I think it's really, really interesting to read in terms of understanding human motivation. Uh, for uh, behavioral economics, there's Daniel Kahneman. Please read Daniel Kahneman. Dan Ariely is a really great read as well. To read Dan Ariely is really fun. So you can read uh, them. Richard Thaler, that's another. You can place behavioral economists in Google and you will find a lot of them, the, the most famous one. But Daniel Kahneman is the one I enjoy the most in terms of the approach in his book. I, I think it's more, it's not just anecdotal, it's a little bit more serious, but if you prefer a more, uh, easy and palatable reading, then I really could be the one. So what I do is try to read around uh, about all these things, yeah, right? And from there, trying to understand how games work around those models to try to modulate how I can use gamification in real life. That's, that's my approach to the research I do, right? So I don't read that much around gamification. I do, but case studies, I, I, I I'm finding a lot with academia in terms of gamification. They are still researching if points and batches and leaderboards work. And that's not the question they should be asking. They're not asking about game design paradigms and game design structures, and they're not asking the right question. So uh, I would say it's better to go to those uh, areas of knowledge. Okay, I hope. Okay. Thank you very much. Perfect, amazing. And if you didn't catch all that, I'll take a snippet of this part of the recording and send it to everyone. So you can take some of the names. Out. Amazing. <laughs> Any other question I can answer for you right now? <laughs> well, I think that's it. Amazing. Yeah. I, I hope I was able to keep you engaged through three hours of a lot of theory. I know this. I know a workshop should be more, less theory and more action. I know I, that's why I called the play shop, where you could interact in some parts of the presentation. Uh, but I know the, this is a lot, a lot of information. But I wanted to give you the the the, the minimum information you really need to actually at least evaluate a gamification project to be able to analyze a gamification project. That was my goal here. So I uh, I hope you don't mind that, and I hope you were engaged for the long three hours, the, the three long hours. And thank you so much for everything. Hope we, hope we can be con uh, connected. Absolutely. Anything I can do for you? I'm there. <laughs> thank you so much, Javier. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, oh, amazing, John. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>